record and get started. We are rapidly, actually, need that, rapidly approaching the end of the class. Um, so let's talk game plan. Uh, we are going to finish off the rest of our central nervous system discussion uh, by talking about our spinal plexus and reflexes, which is fun to say. Uh, and then we get to start our discussion of the autonomic nervous system, which we will continue on into um, uh, Thursday's lecture. Uh, we will not be covering any of the sensory stuff other than the sensory stuff we talked about in relation to the cranial nerves. So there won't be any additional anatomy or physiology from that other than what we've already covered, which included talking about vision, talking about uh, taste, talking about smell and some of those, and obviously the skin as well uh, for the final exam. Um, oh, actually, we do have one more assignment, too. Da, da, da. The assignment that you have due is the uh, unit uh, 14 review, which is pages, uh, where is that, uh, 383 through 388. Uh, so we will be doing that. Um, also, uh, there is a lab that we usually do in the classroom, but in looking at it, I think most of these things are things you'll be able to do. Hold on, there's a chat here. Um, yes, the nervous system is going to be on the final. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so uh, uh, there's a lab we usually do in the classroom. Um, look, by looking at it, most of it are things you should be able to do at home. Um, again. Uh, so there, there are reflex checks. So you're going to be checking your reflexes. Uh, hopefully you have somebody around you that you can do this to, a consenting adult preferably, uh, that is willing to do this. If not, uh, some of these things can be done to yourself, not easily. It's hard to shine a light in your eye and observe your own reflex of the eye. But uh, do the best you can with that, and I am going to have you complete the activities from that, answer the questions of that on those pages, and turn that in on Thursday as well. Uh, so that's going to be due on Thursday, so you have a couple days to play with that. If there's anything that for any reason you can't do, then write, do it as a thought experiment. Write what you think the results are going to be. If you just write, I was not able to do this activity, yeah, I'm not going to give you the points for that. All right, It's okay if you're not able to do that activity, but at this point in the class, you should be able to do it as a thought experiment. All right, if I did do it, this is what I think will happen. And the good news is, is even if you're wrong, you'll still get the credit for it. But just saying I wasn't able to do it isn't going to cut it. Figure it out, uh, do it as a thought experiment. But a lot of things on there you should be able to do. And then obviously you have your last unit review, which is due Thursday as well. Sorry, I was in a meeting before this and so a um, little frazzled because I didn't get as much prep time as I would have liked normally for this. All right, so I think that's good there. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, uh, Obviously, the age of the child uh, makes a difference, uh, but you know anybody if they can follow directions again, obviously um, they you know being able to relax while you gently hit them in the knee with a hammer or you shine a little you know pen light in their eye or something like that they 'll be fine. Nothing there should be too damaging. you probably don 't have any tuning forks, so you won 't be able to necessarily do those type of activities, uh, but some of you may have things like that, so uh, again, uh, play with what you have, do what you can, and uh, if you can 't do anything, then like I said, do it as a thought experiment. Uh, use common sense as to whether you use a child. Obviously, the age, the you know, and all the other things. Uh, don't put anybody, uh, child or adult, in a dangerous situation. I don't think any of these labs necessarily do that, but um, be smart. Your adults, be smart. Um, hold on. Let's get to the rest of this, and then I'll answer those questions. Those are all good questions about the final. Um, Week from today is our lab and lecture exam. Again, the format of those is similar to the ones we've done before. Uh, I haven't finished tabulating the information because I was on this meeting this morning, but most of what I've seen, the other class seem to like the format of having all the questions presented to them at once. I had about an equal number of technical issues with that as we did one at a time. So I think we'll go ahead and try that format in this class as well. So both the lab and lecture exam, you'll have all the questions presented to you at once. Uh, still going to have a tight time schedule for to be able to complete that and do that. And you can do that in any order. So again, you know the format of those and it's going to be available from 10 to 6. You know what is expected of you for that. Then a week later, 
on the 19th, you will have your final exam. Again, to reiterate what I said, absolutely, the nervous system is going to be on the final. Uh, and again, it's not going to exactly work out this way. But if you think about it, this class is divided up into five parts. And so the final will be mostly divided up into five parts. So about 20 questions of each of those uh, five parts is about probably how it's going to work out. Uh, so yes, it will get equal billing as well as all of the other sections as well, like one fifth uh, you know, everything through uh, or orientation and terms, directional terms and cells, uh, tissues and the skin, our section, uh, muscles, bones, and nervous system. Those are your big five sections, and they should all be probably equally expressed on the exam. Uh, the final exam, you're going to have less time to complete it because it's all multiple choice questions. A minute a question is more than enough time uh, to be able to complete that. Also, I'm going to limit the time range of which it can be completed as well to the, strictly to the class time. I'm not going to be so mean as to say that you have to complete it within the two hours that is our normal final slot. I appreciate that we need to be a little bit more flexible with the schedule, but being a multiple choice exam, I am going to be more restrictive on when it is, and so I am going to keep it uh, within the class time uh, for when that will be available. So make sure you start with enough time to be able to complete that uh, within uh, the time that is available for you. Um, yes, there could be uh, questions, there could be labeling questions or things along those lines, an image with uh, things pointed at it. Uh, that could be something, another type of question that you might see. Again, they're all gonna be multiple choice questions, but there may be some different formats. There could definitely be some images that you'll need to be able to identify. Uh, the other type of question that you really haven't seen in a multiple choice question before, although you may have every once in a while it shows up, uh, for some of the more elaborate processes, you may be given the steps and then you have to put the steps in order. Right, you have to say, is it four, one, two, three, or is it, you know, three, two, five, eight, or whatever it is. So there may be questions like that, but for the most part, it should be pretty straightforward. Yes, Open Lab, uh, extra credit points. Uh, if I can get that information from Jeff, should still be something that people are going to be able to take advantage of. If you did the Science uh, Success Center, uh, that is something that you'll still get extra credit for for doing those activities as well. And uh, so, yeah, I have to reach out to Jeff. Actually, it's a remind myself to do that. Yeah, I will reach out to him for that information. I still I will get it from him. I do not put it into the um, I do not put it into the grade book. Uh, until the very end of the class because I don't want you counting on those points. I want you getting the grade that you want without it. Yes, to answer your question, uh, my goal, uh, maybe. Uh, again, you got to remember that I've got both your exams and I also have uh, my 431 exams that I'm going to be grading uh, prior to uh, the finals. So I'm going to do my best to get everything graded, uh, but I can't guarantee I will have it graded before the final so that you know what it is. What I can tell you is that I will be posting your final grades on Canvas before I make them official. Uh, so again, I, in speaking with one of the students, I heard that there is an actual date for the excused withdrawal of the 20th. I still have not gotten confirmation from my department chair if that is accurate or not. We were told that you could get the excused withdrawal up to the point that the grades were made official online. So I don't know what the true answer of that is. I have not heard back from that yet. Um, but... Um, so what I will definitely be doing is I'll be posting the grades on Canvas before I make them official so that if you have any questions or concerns, uh, you can ask those questions and then I will make them official after that. And so that way you can make an educated decision based on that. And I'll do my best to get things graded in a timely fashion. Uh, so I don't, but I don't know if you'll know the grades on the lab and lecture exams before you take the final. Uh, whether I curve exam five or not isn't up to me, it's up to you guys depending on how you do. Uh, the, uh, the the last lab and lecture exams in the other class that they took, uh, their, their test didn't need a curve, so it wasn't necessary to curve it. I've curved it if it needs it. If, uh, if it doesn't, then I won't. Uh, yes, you'll still get your participation points, but like the extra credit points, I do not put them into the grade book because I don't want you counting on them. Uh, try to get the grade that you want without it, and if you fall a little bit short, hopefully the things like the participation grade, hopefully things like the extra credit will take you up and over the top. All right, but don't count on them. Get the grade you want without them and then those points don't matter. And remember, participation is not an exam. I mean, it's not extra credit. It is a grade that you get for participating in this class. Um, 
you get participation points by being active in the class, participating, turning things in on time, coming to the lectures, listening to the lectures, doing things on that point. Uh, and nobody, uh, usually participation more is an issue in the classroom. Uh, again, I'm not requiring attendance or, or, or taking attendance here. So uh, no, anybody who had, would have lost participation points prior to us going online would still have lost those points. But I will tell you now, nobody in the class lost those participation points. So uh, unless you have stopped completing assignments or stopped taking exams or stopped uh, you know, turning things in, then you should consider yourself to have your full participation points. And everybody who's here listening to this, I'm guessing has been turning everything in and is getting all their participation. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, no, I'm not curving exam three. We've moved past exam three. I'm not making any changes to that. Uh, so it's uh, all forward from here. All right. Great questions. Any others? All right, excellent. All right, good question. So hopefully that is our game plan. Uh, we've got uh, essentially two weeks left. So uh, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be a whirlwind. It's going to be tremendous amount of fun. Uh, so that is the game plan. So let's go ahead and dive back into our lectures. All right, I need to switch what I'm sharing to the lecture. There we go. Put that there. And then I need to bring back up my annotation tools. Got that there. And I'm tired of looking at my fuzzy face. So let's go ahead and stop distracting you from that. And we can dive back into lecture. We left off last time. And we had been talking about the anatomy of the spinal cord and the anatomy associated with the spinal cord. That there. So I can grab that. The roots and the nerves and then the branches that come off of those. And as we talked about, the dorsal root is pure sensory coming in. The ventral root is pure, pure motor coming out. Our spinal nerve is a mixed nerve then having both sensory and motor. And again, if you think about it, those are those three classes that we talked about cranial nerves. Some cranial nerves are sensory only, some are motor only, some are mixed. Uh, no, the brain does not have an epidural space, right? Again, remember our spinal cord has an epidermal space above the dura mater. But remember in our skull, uh, the second layer of our dura mater is actually the periosteum of the bone. So it is actually, the dura is actually attached to the skull on the inside. And as we talked about, the reason for that is the bones of our skull don't move. So we can have it anchored to the skull because the bones of our skull don't move. Uh, our vertebral column has to have flexibility and movement. So we don't want to attach the protective surfaces to my vertebrae. If my vertebrae have to be able to twist and turn and bend, we want instead that loose connective tissue to provide that protection and connection uh, surrounding it so that it is not there as well. Um, cool. Uh, does the dorsal root pretty much the same as the dorsal root ganglion structurally and functionally? Um, eh, yes uh, and no. Um, both are sensory structures. You are correct that way. Um, and so obviously both are related to sensory uh, neurons and those neurons, as we know, are unipolar. However, what you have to remember is the root is made up of the axons of those sensory neurons and the dorsal root ganglion is made up of the cell bodies. So uh, if we cheat and draw on this picture, right, here in the dorsal root ganglion is where we would have that unipoly, unipolar um, cell body of that unipolar sensory neuron. And then its axon comes out and that information would come in this way and go through like that there. And of course that would actually connect and not be drawn like that. But you get the idea. So yes, they are both, uh, they're both sensory, they're both associated with unipolar neurons, but the dorsal root ganglion is where the cell body is and the dorsal root is where the axons are. All right. We also mentioned how from the spinal nerve, we then have four distinct branches that come off. These two here, the white ramus and the gray ramus are the ones that are going to go to and be a part of our sympathetic pathway that we'll talk about either today or we may get to on uh, Thursday. 
do we need to specify? Yes, absolutely. If I ask you what the dorsal root, uh, dorsal root is comprised of, or if I ask you what, you what the dorsal root ganglion contains, yes, you should be able to distinguish where the cell bodies are located and where the axons are located. The same way that our multipolar neurons, our motor neurons are located in the gray horn of the spinal cord, and their axons form the roots and the nerves and the ramy and all of those things as well. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we're gonna start playing with that today when we talk about our autonomic nervous system. And actually, really kind of the next part as well. So, as I mentioned, our spinal nerve branches to form these four branches. Two of them, the white ramus, which is the lateral ramus, the gray ramus, which is the medial ramus, and notice this illustration has them correct. Oh, no, it doesn't. Uh, no, it doesn't. It has them backwards. Oh, that sucks. All right, well, they're wrong. Um, white is lateral, gray is medial. We'll see that when we look at the autonomic stuff next. Um, artist, wrong. But they are correct in that the ramy communicantes are these collectively. The dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus, the dorsal ramus, as we talked about, goes to the back and the muscles of the skin. I mean, the, the muscles and skin of the back. These are autonomic in function. And so what I really want to talk about next are these ventral ramus. A ventral ramus doesn't just come out and go to just one location. Most of our ventral ramus actually form big elaborate networks. And hopefully, as you remember, a term for a big elaborate network is a plexus. So you have these plexes uh, that, and there are four main elaborate plexes that go to most of the parts of the body. Now notice I did say most of the ventral roots. If you look closely here in the thoracic region, these thoracic ventral rami don't form elaborate networks. Instead, they pretty much just follow that intercostal groove of the ribs. So there's that costal groove on the ribs. And yes, these are on both sides. That is correct. They're only showing one side, but you have these plexes on both sides. So all these plexes are paired. Uh, these are the only ones. The thoracic pretty much don't uh, form, um, although you can see 12 a little bit, uh, one and two a little bit. Uh, but for the majority of them, they just are located within the costal grooves of our ribs. We can take a little bit of a closer look at these uh, plexes. Uh, normally, I would hold you responsible for a lot more of the information for these. Uh, but what for this test, what I'm going to hold you responsible for is thus. I'm going to hold you responsible for knowing the name of the plexes. So here, for instance, our first one is the cervical plexus you are going to be responsible for knowing which ventral rami form the plexus. So notice the cervical plexus is made up of axons that come from uh, the ventral roots for C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. And you are going to be responsible for knowing what part of the body they innervate. So in this case, the cervical plexus uh, innervates uh, and so goes to, carries nerves from. And again, remember, all of these plexes are mixed nerves. That means that they are both sensory and motor. What that means is that if I were to cut one of these nerves, right, cut that nerve right there, then that means I am not gonna receive any sensory information from that part of the body, and I'm not gonna have any motor control of that part of the body. So it is important to remember that all these nerves are mixed nerves. So when we say supplies part of the head, neck, and shoulders, we are talking about tactile sensation from those regions, as well as motor control of those regions. All right, now, I am not going to hold you responsible for too many individual nerves and for the individual, I'm not gonna make you draw this cervical uh, plexus by, for instance, whereas the brachial plexus I used to, I uh, would normally make you draw, but you're getting off the hook on that one. But there are some nerves that we need to talk about in relationship to those, where is it? Ah. And for the cervical plexus, there is one nerve you're responsible for because it's a very interesting nerve. And it's this one right here, the phrenic nerve. If you look closely, you can see that the phrenic nerve is comprised of axons from C3, C4, 
and C5. So if we were to take our highlighter and draw this, here is our phrenic nerve down here. So notice some of the axons are coming off of C3, some of the axons are coming off of C4, some of the axons are coming off C5. What makes this one interesting is, does anybody know what the phrenic nerve actually does? No one are we all shy this morning? All right, well, it turns out your phrenic nerve controls the diaphragm. Why might that be important? That should be something you should be able to answer. Absolutely, for breathing. It, the diaphragm is what allows you to breathe. Now, if I look back up here, head, neck, and shoulders, right? Point to your head, neck, and shoulders. Point to where your diaphragm should be. Where's your diaphragm? Is it where your head, neck, and shoulders are? No, it's way at the bottom of your ribs. So why is this nerve misplaced? Why have something that controls a structure that is so low in our body coming off of such a superior part of our spinal cord? Well, it's for protection. Think of it this way. If you damage a portion of your spinal cord, what happens to information below that point? Someone's in a car, yeah, you lose it. So someone's in a car accident and they have an injury in their lumbar region of the spinal cord and now suddenly they can't walk anymore. Or you can get an injury up near your shoulder blades where you lose complete control of everything below your head. A complete paraplegic, where you have no sense of touch, you have no ability to move anything from your head down. But can you breathe? Yeah. The advantage of having the phrenic nerve at such a high location is as it turns out, most spinal cord injuries typically occur from C7 down. So again, you can have a C7 injury where you can no longer move your arms or your legs or your trunk or feel anything from those parts of your body, but you are still able to breathe. So the reason the phrenic nerve is located in such a high location is because it protects your ability to breathe. In fact, there's a non mnemonic for that. Uh, axon C3, 4, and 5 keep you alive because they uh, form the phrenic nerve, which controls your diaphragm. All righty, let's move to our next plexus. This plexus is uh, the most elaborate and most beautiful of all the plexes. As you can see here, uh, it is the brachial plexus made up of roots from C4 through T1. Those roots form trunks, those trunks form divisions, those divisions form cords, those cords form nerves. It is this beautiful elaborate system that we have this really pretty picture uh, that goes along with it. And uh, normally I would actually make you learn these pathways and actually draw these pathways, but because of the interest of time and the fact that we've ran out of it, uh, you are off the hook for that. What I will mention is that there are six important nerves that do come off of the brachial plexus. Uh, as we can see, the brachial plexus, not surprisingly, innervates the muscles of the arm. So if you think about the muscles that we've already learned, and here we see all the branches of the brachial plexus, we have our muscular cutaneous nerve, which goes to your elbow flexors. Uh, of course, that is your uh, bicep brachia, your brachialis, and your brachioradialis. We have the median and ulnar nerves, which are the ones that come down and go to the flexors of the wrist and the hand. 
And if you remember back in ancient times when we were talking about the bones actually in the classroom, we actually learned something interesting about this ulnar nerve. Again, I'm not holding you responsible for the divisions, but I do want to point out to you what they've done here. The yellow are the anterior nerves. The green are the posterior nerves. Those are the two divisions, anterior and posterior. Notice the posterior nerves are posterior, the anterior nerves are anterior. That's convenient. But notice here, this green nerve here is the radial nerve. It is a posterior nerve, but notice when it gets to the elbow, that posterior nerve actually comes to the front of the elbow to be protected in the elbow joint and then goes back to the back of the arm again. And then there's our pesky ulnar nerve. Our ulnar nerve is an anterior nerve. It should want to stay in the front of the arm. But if you notice, it actually goes behind that big large bump that is the medial condyle of our humerus, putting it in that exposed location that if we talked about, if you hit it at just the right or just the wrong point, it sends a tingling sensation down the entire uh, medial aspect of the hand, making you jump around and scream, and everybody else finds it hilarious, which is why we call that, what? What do we call that when you irritate that ulnar nerve? All right, there you go, hitting the funny bone, absolutely. So remember, way back when we talked about that big, large medial condyle, we actually talked about that ulnar nerve, and we see it here and just how wonky it really is. So I mentioned the radial nerve is a posterior one. So it does the shoulder and elbow extensors, primarily the tricep brachia. Axillary does our deltoid and our teres minor. And then the last one, notice here, oops, let me erase that so it's not too confusing. Way coming off of our uh, medial cord, and again, you don't need to know these pathways, is our long thoracic. Notice it kind of sneaks out uh, down here and comes towards the ribs, because if you remember right here on the ribs is where we have that serratus anterior muscle, the one that helps to hold the scapula against the back wall of the ribs, so it controls that as well. So as you can see, there are these six nerves, all that control those muscles that we learned in the arm, or many of the muscles we learned in the arm. Our third plexus is our lumbar plexus. Notice our lumbar plexus is made up of rami axons coming off of the ventral rami of L1 through L5, hence the name lumbar. Uh, these are the ones that, as you can see nicely in this illustration, uh, supply uh, the abdominal wall. So in here, the abdominal wall, they come to the pelvic region, to the external genitalia, and also notice the anterior and the medial part of the thigh. One of the interesting nerves located here, and we actually see it, let me get my highlighter, right here. One of the larger nerves of our lumbar plexus is the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve actually comes underneath our inguinal ligament. Remember our inguinal ligament is a ligament, so bone to bone, from the superior anterior iliac, side, uh, iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. And both the femoral artery, femoral nerve, uh, pardon me, femoral artery, femoral vein, and femoral um, nerve all pass out through a little region called the femoral triangle here on the leg. If any of you are EMTs or done any other type of uh, life-saving type of um, uh, uh, studying or classes or things along those lines, if someone has a bad knee a leg injury where they're bleeding profusely and you can't put a proper tourniquet on it, one of the things they encourage you to do is find that femoral triangle and with the palm of your hand, you put pressure on that femoral triangle and that stops and can decrease the blood loss to the leg, helping that person to survive. The problem with that is that those arteries and veins are right next to the nerve and too much pressure can actually crush that femoral nerve. And the result of that is that the person is alive, but now by damaging the nerve, they're going to be walking with a limp. And with the litigious society that we live in, that's why before you save someone's life, always make sure they sign the waiver. All righty. Our, oops, not the one I want. 
The last plexus is the simplest of the plexes, and that is the sacral plexus. As you can see, it is comprised of axons coming off of ventral roots L4 through S5. Its job is to supply information to and receive information from the buttocks, the perineum, and as you can see, the majority of the posterior part of the leg uh, and the lower, the entire lower leg as well. You guys, all of these plexes may mean nothing to many of you, right? Some of this information may be meaningless, meaningful, uh, you know, and not have any significance, never heard of these things before. But what most of you have probably heard of is this right here our sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in your body. And as you can see, that sciatic nerve uh, comes out that greater sciatic notch of the ilium, runs the entire length of the leg posteriorly all the way down to the foot. Because of its location here at the small of the back, uh, and there are a large number of muscles, the buttocks muscles, the back muscles that we weren't, that didn't hold you responsible for, that are responsible for posture. Uh, uh, if you have problems with your posture, if you try to lift too much weight, those muscles can become inflamed. That inflammation of the muscles can lead to irritation of these nerves. And if we irritate this nerve, what do we call that condition? Man, I know you know, what do we call the irritation of the sciatic nerve? Sciatica, absolutely. Sciatica gives a tingling or numbing sensation or weakness to the leg that can go the entire length of the leg. So while many of you uh, may not know these plexes or have ever heard these plexes before, you know, maybe you or someone you love or a grandparent or someone dealt with sciatica and this is that nerve that we were talking about. All right, so again, uh, you don't necessarily need to memorize every single nerve on this list, but we did talk about a couple important nerves. I do expect you to be familiar with those. Uh, and then also, uh, obviously, uh, know your plexes, know which ventral roots for them, and know the parts of the body that they uh, supply uh, information to and receive information from. So uh, typically when we talk about having a pinched or a kinked nerve, typically what is happening is there is some irritation to that nerve. Some of it can be something as simple as when you're sitting cross-legged. If you're sitting cross-legged, you could be putting pressure on a region of that nerve. And basically when you constrict it, you constrict blood flow to that area. And when you constrict blood flow to that area, it decreases its functionality. When you then shift your leg position, blood flows back to that area, and that nerve, which had been irritated but silent because it wasn't able to be metabolically active, suddenly becomes very active, letting you know about it. And you get all that pins and needles sensation uh, and that tingling sensation from that irritation. All right, so that is in the simplest form what we mean by pinching or kinking a nerve. Uh, most cases, when if it's a chronic condition, then what's either happening is there's some kind of morphological problem with the vertebral column where uh, it's maybe being tilted or it could be muscles, like we said with sciatica. In some way, you are getting, yeah, the pins and needles is that's what we're talking about falling asleep. Uh, so that is the simplest example of something like that. But if you have a kinked or a pinched nerve, typically what that means is there's some type of either muscle or bone or, or, or cartilage or something like that that is pushing on the nerve. And as it pushes on the nerve, you get that continuous, uh, either complete uh, silencing of that nerve or, or continuous irritation of that nerve. Uh, and so it'd be basically like having that, uh, that falling asleep sensation, that pins and needles sensation, uh, but continuously. So again, it depends on the severity. If the kinking is severe enough, then the nerve goes silent. And if it goes silent for a prolonged period of time, that can be potentially a problem. If it's being pushed on, then it's constantly being irritated, then you could be getting constant pain or constant tingling sensation or constant numbness or something along those lines that uh, typically is, is relatively irritating when it occurs. All right, now, these big elaborate plexes 
uh, look like big crazy messes, but they do go to very precise regions of the body. And from a clinical standpoint, that is very useful for us because we can actually map on the body where specific nerves go. And when we do that, uh, so typically during childbirth, if you think about it, is those associated with the lumbar plexus. So some of the nerves like the obturator nerve or some of the other nerves of the lumbar plexus can be. Uh, not typically as much, although it could be the pedendal uh, can be. So again, there are numerous nerves in that area that could be irritated during childbirth. Depends on is it because of the, the movement of the leg or because of the stretch or irritation of the baby being released. There isn't just one nerve that could be uh, uh, cause problems during that. So spinal nerves precisely innervate the body and that precise innervation can be mapped. In fact, we call that map of the innervation of the body, the dermatomes. So here we see a map of the body and which of our rami, which of our uh, branches are going to them. Here are the dorsal rami to the back and to the skin. Here are the ventral rami and the different regions of the body. This is significant for a couple of reasons, uh, primarily from a clinical standpoint. If someone is brought in with uh, some type of um, car accident or something like that, then typically what they're going to do is systematically they are going to touch different parts of the body to see what they can feel and what they can't feel. Can you feel this? No. Can you feel this? No. Can you feel this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. And so then very quickly and very easily, we can assess that the injury is between the L3 and the L4 region of the spinal cord. The other reason this is significant has to do with retroviruses. Uh, one of the more uh, famous isn't the right word, but uh, uh, well uh, known retroviruses right now is shingles. Shingles, as we're learning, has to do with uh, uh, basically uh, the, the um, chickenpox virus. And what happens is that virus can live in your spinal cord. And what it is, is it's actually a retrovirus. What that means is with the right stimulus, and that stimulus some can be times be related to diet, it can be related to stress or other things along those lines. What happens is that retrovirus will go back out the spinal nerve to the specific region of the body associated with that spinal cord, uh, giving you a rash or irritation in that region. However, because it started in the spinal cord, it is going to be located just in that region. So what happens with shingles is people will get a stripe or maybe two stripes. They'll get a stripe right in this region here of irritation or rash or something along those lines. And that's an indication that that shingles retrovirus is located in the T8, T9 region of the spinal cord. So like I said, these dermatomes, our understanding of how the nerves innervate our body. Um, great question. Uh, how these innervate our body uh, play an important role in uh, our diagnosing uh, the conditions of them. Meningitis, remember, an itis is an inflammation. The meninges, remember, are the protective layers around the brain and spinal cord. So what happens is typically within the arachnoid matter, but sometimes in the pia or dura matter, uh, you can get uh, inflammation within that region. It can be a swelling of uh, fluid. It could be a tumor that is forming there or whatever it is, but you get some irritation and swelling of those protective tissues that are surrounding uh, the brain and spinal cord. So those wouldn't necessarily associate with the spinal nerves. Although I guess if it happened in the spinal cord, there'd be the potential that that inflammation could constrict a spinal nerve as it left the spinal cord, so you might, it might express itself that way. No, meningitis can be caused by a virus. It can be caused by uh, you know, a, a, a head injury. It can be caused by numerous things. It can be a cancer. There, there, there are numerous causes. Again, meningitis itis is just inflammation. It's an inflammation of the meninges. So uh, the same way that your hand can become inflamed for lots of reasons. It could be burned. It could be, you know, viral. It could be that you slammed it in a car door or whatever it is. Uh, your liver, can, it can be viral. It could be that you're drinking vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because now you're home quarantined, right? So again, just means inflammation of the meninges, and there can be multiple causes. 
All right, the last thing we have to talk about for the spinal cord is our spinal reflexes. One of the important and key things to remember about a reflex is that reflexes are fast, they are involuntary, and they are predictable. A lot of people forget about this part, right? We think of the fast and involuntary, right? If I put my hand on something hot, I pull my hand away quickly without having to voluntarily think about it. Hey, that is hurting my hand. I really should pull it away right now. But the other advantage of reflexes is that they are predictable. You're gonna get a chance to play with this if you're able to do some of those lab activities. When you shine a light into somebody's eyes, what do you expect the pupil of their eye to do? Get nice and big to let more light in? Yeah, it's gonna constrict, it's gonna get smaller. When you go to the doctor's office, back in ancient times when you were allowed to go to the doctor's office for just a checkup, one of the things he would do is hit you in the knee with a hammer, which you'll have a chance. Again, don't use a real hammer to do that. Use something, you know, use like a wooden spoon or use like a, a plastic ladle or something like that. Don't use a real hammer. But if you gently hit that patella uh, ligament, what happens when you're at the doctor's office? All right, your leg kicks out. Absolutely, your leg kicks out. If it's predictable, that's why he's doing it. He shines a light in your eyes because he's looking for a predictable result. He hits you in the knee with a hammer because he's looking for a predictable result. If he hits you in the knee with a hammer and your arm goes up in the air, you're getting more testing done, right? Because again, the th key with reflexes is they're predictable. Now, in defining reflexes, right, reflexes are typically uh, integrated in our central nervous system. Right. Integration occurs in our central nervous system. It's one of our three functions. And too often we think about the brain as being the only area where that integration takes place. But for many of our reflexes, uh, it is actually the spinal cord where our integration takes place. In fact, that's one of the ways we can distinguish our reflexes. Why are you not doing this? There we go. Some reflexes are spinal, some reflexes are cranial. And again, the key to our definition here is where does the integration take place? In the case of someone shining the light in your eyes, that would actually be a spinal, re uh, pardon me, a cranial reflex, right? Because if you think about it, vision is cranial nerve two. That information goes into our visual uh, cortex and then comes out, go see an in, and our cranial nerve three, our ocular motor, is where that information goes out. So notice spinal and cranial reflexes are not just where the integration takes place, but they're also involving the pathways. If it involves a spinal nerve, it is a spinal reflex. If it involves cranial nerves, it is a cranial reflex. So shining the light in your eye and having your pupil constrict is a cranial reflex. Hitting someone in the knee with a hammer and having their leg kick up in the air is a spinal reflex. Also when defining reflexes, reflexes can be somatic or they can be autonomic or visceral. And basically the key here is the effector. Uh, well, tr uh, you, you are correct. The, the hitting the knee with a hammer is a spinal reflex because it involves the spinal nerves. We have our, our sensory neuron, which carries that information in through that ventral um, ramus and through that plexus to our spinal cord, through the dorsal root, where it's processed by our gray matter of our spinal cord, and then our somatic motor carries the information out to our leg to move it. In fact, we'll actually see that uh, reflex and draw that reflex. We'll not draw it, but we'll talk about that reflex and see it. Reflexes can be somatic or autonomic based on the effector. If the effector is skeletal muscle, like again, the hitting in the knee with a hammer, that is a somatic reflex, because it is a somatic pathway. If it is smooth muscle, like shining the light in your eye, or cardiac muscle, or glands, 
if that is one of the effectors, then it would be an autonomic. So again, shining the light in your eye, smooth muscle changes the size of your iris. That would be an autonomic or a visceral reflex. Reflexes can also be innate or they can be learned. Right? And innate means that we are born with it. There have been some really interesting studies looked at innate reflexes in babies. One of the most powerful ones is actually what they call the suckle reflex. Newborn baby pops right out of mom. The first thing you do is you touch her cheek. And if you touch her cheek, she will tilt her head to that tactile sensation and try to latch on. We are born with that, all right? Now, if you take that same baby, as soon as it's popped out of mom, put it in the driver's seat of the car, have it going 45 miles down the road, have a small child jump out into the middle of the street, will that baby instantly both try to step on the gas pedal, but also more importantly, put their right arm up to hold back the person in the seat next to them? No, that baby's not gonna do that. However, you do it, or maybe you're teaching your teenager to drive and you're in the passenger seat and a ball comes rolling out into the street. And even though you're on the passenger seat and there ain't one there, you still stomp trying to get onto that, st that, that uh, stop pedal to stop, the get, you know, to stop the car from going the brake pedal, right? So there are some reflexes that are learned, right? Or my favorite, knock, knock. Pavlov, just checking. Right, good old Pavlov, right? He looked at acquired reflexes, right? He rang the bell and gave a steak to a dog. And the dog salivated when he saw the steak. And he rang the bell and gave a steak to the dog and the dog salivated. And he rang the bell and gave a steak to the cell. And suddenly, all he had to do was ring the bell and what would happen, right? Ring the bell and the dog would salivate as a result of that, right? So those are all examples of learned reflexes. All right, two more. This is where things get a tiny bit trickier. Uh, reflexes can be both inhibitory or excitatory. And by this, what we mean is the effect it has on the effector. When I shine the light in your eye, your smooth muscle of your iris constricts. Right, so it actually contracts, and that is an excitatory effect that occurs in there. When you put your hand on something hot, your flexor muscles, if you think about it, remember when we flexed all our muscles, we curled up into the fetal position. We talked about how those flexors are protective. So if I touch something hot, my flexor, like my bicep brachia, contracts so that I can pull my arm away and that's excitatory as well. But if you think about it, to put my hand out there to touch something hot, I was contracting my tricep brachia. I was extending my elbow. And if I'm contracting my extensor and my flexor at the same time, is my arm gonna move through space? No, think of it this way, right? Again, I'm not encouraging anyone to do this thought experiment only, but if you were to, let's say, step outside and find an electric fence, and you were to grab onto that electric fence, right? that electric fence would send an electrical stimulus up your entire arm, causing every single muscle of your arm to contract. And that's the problem, because can you let go if every single muscle of your arm is contracting? No. So think about it, when you touch something hot, you don't want every single muscle of your arm to be contracting. You want your flexors to contract, so we want to excite those, but we also want to inhibit our extensors, and that's what allows us to actually pull away. So if I want to pull away from something hot, I need to both flex my bicep brachia and inhibit my uh, tricep brachia so that I can pull away. So it's going to be either excitatory or inhibitory. Does it increase the activity or decrease the activity? Does it cause it to contract or does it cause it to relax?
And here's where we get to the anatomy of these reflexes. Reflexes can uh, have be monosynaptic or polysynaptic. And as that name simply indicates, it is the number oops, of synapses in a reflex. With a monosynaptic, as the name would indicate, you have one synapse. If you have one synapse, and I'll cheat and I'll draw it up here because it's out of the way, you have one neuron with its axon, forms a synapse on a second neuron, which carries the information out. There you go. That's a monosynaptic reflex. It is one synapse and two neurons. The second you add another neuron to the mix, notice now I have one, two synapses. I have more than one synapse. And I have more than one synapse. I'm polysynaptic. And so if you want to have more than one synapse, I need three or more neurons. Lastly, contralateral and ipsilateral. Contra, ipsilateral, of course, means that same side for the stimulus and the effect. If I touch something hot with my right hand, my right hand pulls away. Contralateral is when the effect crosses the midline. Think of it this way. If I touch something, if I touch a hot a coal with my right hand, I pull my right hand away. But what if I'm just walking down the street and I step on a hot coal with my right foot? Do I just want to pull my right foot away and do nothing else? If I'm walking and I just suddenly withdraw my right foot, I'm going to lose balance and I'm going to fall over. So at the same time I'm pulling away with my right leg, I have to expend my left leg so that I'm able to maintain balance. And so notice for that type of reflex, I would need to have contralateral control. I would need information to cross the midline. We could literally spend half a semester talking about reflexes. The good news is you already know most of this information. Right? A lot of this stuff is intuitive and it makes sense. These last two are a little tricky, but we'll talk about a little bit more. But at its core, the job of reflexes, and I guess that's the one thing that we don't have up here, reflexes are fast, involuntary, and predictable. But again, remember, if you think about it, the goal of the reflex is to maintain homeostasis, right? Keep the body happy, keep the body healthy. And we know how to do that, right? If you think about it, we need five things to be able to do that. So let's talk about what those five things are, All right? A reflex arc is, again, a process of maintaining homeostasis. Notice part one, we need some type of sensory receptor. Notice in this case, we are pricking our thumb with a pin. We then need our sensory pathway to carry that information in. Again, notice as we've talked about, uh, this sensory we know is afferent, carrying information in. And notice, we also know since this is a sensory neuron and they've conveniently enough shown this for us, it is a unipolar neuron that is going to carry that information in. We then need some type of integration. We need to make decisions. And remember, as we talked about, where we make decisions is at our synapses. Synapses are where we make our decision. So notice that occurs in our gray matter. Notice this particular illustration here has one, two synapses. 
So notice this one has an interneuron involved in this process as well, although that isn't required. We then need a motor neuron that is going to be efferent. Right? And of course, as we know, motor neurons in this case is going to a skeletal muscle. So it is somatic motor. And notice conveniently enough, we know that neuron cell body is located in the anterior gray horn. And then we need an effector. And as we just mentioned, this effector is skeletal muscle. You think about it, there really isn't any new information. The second day of class, we talked about homeostasis. We talked about these components that are necessary to maintain homeostasis. And while we didn't use the term reflex at that time, that essentially is what we were talking about. Now, as I also mentioned, these are all great. Your book does an excellent job of talking about reflexes. Uh, it talks about four different types of reflexes. I'm only going to hold you responsible for two of them. The two important reflexes you need to know are all somatic spinal reflexes. So again, they are all a spinal. So they all involve spinal cord and spinal nerves. Somatic of course, means that they're all going to influence skeletal muscle. And those two are actually the two we've already talked about today. Our stretch reflex, when you get hit in the, in the knee with a hammer, that is your stretch reflex. And that flexor or withdrawal reflex, when you are in pain. So let's take a look at those. Here is our stretch reflex. Now, again, anytime we talk about a reflex, we want to think of what the goal of the reflex is. And of course, we know the goal is to maintain homeostasis, but maintain homeostasis means a lot of things. In this case, the goal of our stretch reflexes is to maintain our posture, right? Maintain our balance. Unless, you have had way too much vodka for breakfast this morning, right? You should be able to stand up with your head up and your eyes closed and maintain a relatively stable standing position. The reason for that is inside the muscles of your body, we have a special sensory receptor known as a muscle spindle. known as muscle spindles. And what happens is that they fire action potentials based on how much they are stretched. So here's your body. If, as you're standing here, you slowly started to lean to the left, then what would happen is the muscles in your abdominal region would be stretched out. And as they stretched out, they would start, the muscle spindles in them would increase their firing rate. Saying, hey, I'm being stretched out. I'm elongating. You want to be standing still. I should not be elongating. So what happens is it sends a signal to the spinal cord and the spinal cord sends a signal back to these muscles telling the muscle, you need to contract a little. And if you contract a little bit, you're gonna get shorter and you're gonna bring us back into balance. And that will pull us back in the opposite direction. These are small subtle changes that are being made because we're getting small changes in the firing rate as you slowly lean back and forth. However, that's what the doctor does to trick your stretch reflex. What happens is they hit your patella ligament and it pulls violently on the muscle. 
again, don't hit so hard that you're bruising someone. But what happens is it causes a, a rapid jerk of the muscle. And that stretch receptor gets elongated really quickly. And the stretch receptor goes, holy crap, we're falling backwards, right? I'm getting elongated. I'm getting way stretched out. You got to really contract this muscle. And so it sends a powerful signal back to the muscle and the muscle contracts, trying to bring you back in balance. And so that's why the leg kicks out. It's tricking into thinking that you're falling down. And so your leg jerks out to try to maintain your balance. And as you can see, it is a super simple, it is a ipsilateral and it is a monosynaptic reflex. Again, monosynaptic means there are just two neurons. And only one synapse. So we have our first part, our stretch receptor, that muscle spindle. Then we have our second part, which is our unipolar sensory neuron. whose cell body is located in the dorsal uh, root ganglion. It comes in and notice the sensory neuron synapses directly on the somatic motor neuron. We have our one synapse here in the anterior gray horn where that increased firing rate tells this, excites the motor neuron. And when the motor neuron is excited, it excites the muscle, our effector. That's our, so here was our third part, integration. Our motor pathway, which is four. And then the effect, on our effector five is our muscle contracts. It really is just that simple. That is our most basic, simplest reflex, that ability to maintain our balance by knowing how long the muscle is and then causing the muscle to contract to maintain a consistent length. It is an ipsilateral monosynaptic reflex that ability to maintain balance. All right, questions on that? All right, let's look at the next one. The next one's a little bit more complicated, but uh, still not too bad. Uh, don't worry about that, here we go. And this is our flexor or withdrawal reflex. Again, remember our goal is always to maintain homeostasis, but specifically with the flexor or what's known as the withdrawal reflex, the goal is protection, right? To pull the body away from pain. Notice again, part one, we have a sensory receptor. In this case, our sensory receptor is perceiving pain. And anyone remember all the way back in our integumentary system what the name of the sensory structure was that perceives pain? And seeing as this is a cumulative class, if we don't know it, then I now know what the first question on your cumulative final exam is going to be. And you remember the tactile receptor, our free nerve endings. Our free nerve endings are the one that perceive pain. Once again, we have our sensory a neuron, that afferent pathway. Carrying that information, I'm gonna cheat and stick this down here carrying that information into our spinal cord. And then here, and again, through the dorsal root and the dorsal root ganglion. And here in the spinal cord, we have part three, our integration. Now notice here, there are multiple neurons involved in this process. So notice there's more than one synapse. So this is of course, 
polysynaptic. Notice the first thing that happens is our sensory neuron communicates to an interneuron. That interneuron then communicates with a second interneuron. And notice we also over here have two motor neurons. Notice one uh, communicates with the flexor or controls the flexor and two controls the extensor. So here's what happens. This first interneuron does two things. The first thing it does, and I'll write it up here. So our white interneuron, just to help distinguish them, communicates directly to the flexor motor neuron. And it stimulates it. Of course, if it stimulates it, then that means M1, I'm gonna call it M1 for motor neuron one, fires action potentials. And if it fires action potentials, that stimulates the flexor to contract which is what we want. We want the arm to pull away. But notice there's a second interneuron. Our first interneuron also stimulates the second interneuron. And of course, when it's stimulated, it fires action potentials. But here's where things get interesting. The second interneuron job is to inhibit the extensor motor neuron. It opens up those potassium channels, it opens up chloride channels. And if that's the case, then I'm going to call that a second motor neuron, the uh, extensor motor neuron, M2, is inhibited. And it does not fire action potentials. And if it does not fire action potentials, our extensor muscle relaxes. So what happens here is this muscle is inhibited and this muscle relaxes. Our flexor muscle is stimulated. This muscle contracts. And in that way, we are able to pull away from the painful stimulus. And notice there's a dotted line here. The second interneuron does one other thing as well. It also sends a signal to the brain to let you know that you've been injured, right? How else are you gonna know that you're supposed to be cursing right now if you don't get that signal going up to the brain to let us know that you are in pain? So notice the advantage of this, the reason we need this complication here is in this part right here, and I'll draw the, uh, the square around it, we need to change the signal. On this side, we want it to be positive. We want it to be excitatory. But on this side, we need it to be inhibitory. We need it to be negative. And the interneurons allow us to do that. Notice our first one was practically hardwired. One neuron communicated with the other neuron. It stimulated it. And the more it stimulated it, the more the muscle contracted. But here, we need to control more than one muscle. If we're going to move our body through space, we need to both stimulate some muscles and relax other muscles so that we're able to pull them away. All righty, questions on that.
All right, so those are our reflexes. Know your reflexes, know the components of the reflexes, know the different types of reflexes, how you classify reflexes, um, no reflexes. There you go. All right, with that, uh, this is everything we need to know for the spinal cord. So we are done with our central nervous system. And so what we're gonna be able to do now is switch gears and talk about our autonomic nervous system. So we'll do that next. Let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, our first break, let's see, it is 1.11 right now. So let's return at 1.21. And uh, we'll start the recording at that time. All right, any questions before we first take our first break? All right, during this break, grab your new materials, grab your uh, study guide for the uh, autonomic nervous system because we're gonna start rattling off anatomy as we're going through it. In your lecture notes from that, we are going to come back and we are on to the autonomic nervous system. Our very last section we will be covering for this class. All right, uh, see you in 10 minutes. All right, I got a good question during the uh, break, so I want to cover that real fast before we switch gears. Um, the vertebral rami, the ventral rami, not the vertebral, ventral rami, uh, that form the plexes. If you looked at the top of all of the plexes where we talked about those on the lecture, it says which axons from which rami form the plexes. So for instance, if you remember uh, the cervical one, here, we can sneak back to one of them. There you go, like the lumbar plexus up here, you can see it is the ventral rami uh, from vertebral portions uh, from the, uh, the spinal cord L1 through L5. Those ventral rami are the ones that form the lumbar plexus. So that's the, uh, the rami information you need, the ventral rami that form them. I'm not making you draw them or anything like that, or I'm not gonna point at this and say, which one of these is the femoral nerve or something like that, but you do need to know which Ramey form which plexes and what part of the uh, body they innervate. All right, uh, I have a raised hand, yes. So the part of the body that it would innervate would be the abdominal wall, external genitals, and the anterior medial. That is correct. Okay. All right. Time to switch gears. And talk about our autonomic nervous system. All right, with our autonomic nervous system, where's my annotations? There it is. Our autonomic nervous system again, is what regulates the activity of our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our glands. Again, this is the part that gives us that involuntary control, right? When you are climbing three flights of stairs, carrying your two bags of groceries, your heart has to beat faster to be able to provide the oxygen and nutrients for your muscles to do that excess work. And it isn't something you have to consciously think about. All right, heart, stump pumping a little bit faster, right? Or come on, stomach, start churning. I just had that cheeseburger for breakfast. This is our involuntary control of our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our glands. And again, of course, our function of all of these things is to maintain homeostasis, uh, to maintain that balance, to function efficiently. And again, because it is outside of our conscious control, essentially it uses reflex arcs to be able to do this, like we just finished talking about. Now, like all reflex arcs, it starts with some type of sensory information coming in. And one of the important things to remember when we're talking about our autonomic nervous system, and I'll write it up here at the top, even though it's about to come up on the screen in just a minute, is that our autonomic nervous system is a motor oops, pathway. When we talk about our autonomic nervous system, we are talking about a motor pathway. And if you think about it, we see that 
as the part of the reflex. When we talk about the sensory information that controls things like our smooth muscle of our stomach, it can be regulated by all types of sensory information. All right? It can be special sensory information, like the taste of the food in our mouth. It could be those enteroreceptors on the inside that are the stretch of our stomach as we eat that cheeseburger for breakfast, and it does it there. But we could also just be thinking about the food or looking at the food, right? Watching one of those Carl Jr.'s commercial, right? Nothing looks better than a cheeseburger on a Carl's Jr. commercial, right? All of this type of information is capable of affecting our autonomic pathways. Internal information, somatic information, right? Your body temperature affects your heart rate, right? So again, you have that cardiac muscle and how fast your heart is beating is determined by your skin. Or if you're in pain, that can affect your heart rate, right? And then, like I said, seeing that cheeseburger, smelling that meat, doing all those types of things, all of that sensory information has the ability to influence our uh, autonomic nervous system. Now, again, it isn't something we voluntarily control. It is outside of our conscious control, but it still needs to involve integration in our central nervous system. And so most of that involuntary processing takes place inside either the medulla oblongata or the hypothalamus. So again, it's not like I'm in pain, my heart should beat faster. It's not something I'm consciously deciding in my cerebral cortex. This is taking place deep in my brain stem uh, within the hypothalamus or the medulla. Here, we see again that subdivisions, uh, functional subdivisions of our uh, nervous system. We have our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system. And in our, uh, in our um, peripheral nervous system, we have our sensory afferent coming in. And we know there are three branches of that as well. But again, we don't care about that with the autonomic nervous system. We know there are two branches of the motor out, somatic, which again, we don't care about. So instead, what we are focusing on is our autonomic. And as we also talked about, there are two further subdivisions to the autonomic nervous system. They are the parasympathetic and the sympathetic divisions or subdivisions. Uh, there is a question. Um, you should write medulla oblongata on the exam. Like any good father, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would prefer medulla oblongata, but I, I wouldn't mark you wrong for writing medulla. All right. Now, the good news is we have some familiarity with motor pathways. And so if you think about our motor pathways, um, I have to clear all of that. We have some familiarity with our motor pathways. Now, normally this is where I draw it on the board, so I am not going to necessarily, uh, how do I wanna do this? What's the best way to do this? Um, yeah, we can draw it. What, we, oh, let's do a table first. So we have our starting point. And we have our effector. And then of course we have the pathway in between. For our, for our somatic motor pathway, we are already learned this. We know it starts in our anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. Oops, didn't mean for that to still be capital or for that to be that big that for that matter. So let's write it out first. We know we start with our anterior gray horn in the spinal cord. And there we have a multipolar neuron.
we know that single multipolar neuron has a myelinated axon. And we know that myelinated axon leaves the ventral root of the spinal cord. And travels all the way to the effector. And of course, we know that effector is going to be skeletal muscle. Because as someone happened to ask two minutes before class began, as you know, our multipolar somatic motor neurons that are located in the anterior gray horn terminate and communicate to our skeletal muscle. And of course, there at our skeletal muscle, it releases what neurotransmitter? What neurotransmitter does our somatic motor neuron release to communicate with skeletal muscle? Excellent, acetylcholine. And I'll go ahead and abbreviate it as well. Releases acetylcholine. And what effect does that acetylcholine have on the skeletal muscle? Is it excitatory or inhibitory? Excellent. Excitatory, perfect. Literally no new information on the board. This may be a, a different way to look at it and think about it, but this is all information that we have totally learned. We totally have understand. We've talked about a couple of times and hopefully this totally makes sense. So now that we remember what our somatic motor pathway is, we can see how our autonomic pathway is going to be different. So let's make it big. Our autonomic motor pathway. Again, we are going to start here in our spinal cord as our starting point. But remember our anterior gray horn is somatic motor. If we are dealing with autonomic motor, what is our starting point? Where are the autonomic motor neuron cell bodies located? Not the posterior gray horn, close. There we go, lateral. So we're gonna start in the lateral gray horn. of the spinal cord. It is, of course, still a motor pathway. So it is still going to be a multipolar neuron. And in its pathway, it is going to have a myelinated axon. that leaves the ventral root of the spinal cord. But notice our somatic goes all the way to the effector, and that is not the case here. Here instead, we have a myelinated axon that leaves the ventral root of the spinal cord. And again, you have to apologize my typing errors. You can't type and spell at the same time. I barely can type as it is. I can barely speak or write on the board as it is, but trying to do both at the same time is fairly hard. It leaves the spinal cord and it doesn't go all the way to the effector. Instead, it synapses ugh, on a second autonomic neuron along the way. So notice here in our somatic motor pathway, there is only one motor neuron in the pathway, but it turns out in our autonomic motor pathway, there are gonna be two motor neurons. And that means we need to give them names. Uh, this is not a general, uh, yeah, well, yes, this is a general rule for all autonomic pathways, yes. So we have to give them names. This first neuron, the one with the myelinated axon, 
whose cell body starts in the uh, lateral gray horn of the um, spinal cord is going to go and synapse to a second autonomic neuron along the way. And of course, if this autonomic neuron, the second autonomic neuron, let's actually write this down here. is not going to be hanging out by itself. There's going to be a cluster of them. And what do we call a cluster, a collection of cell bodies that are outside the central nervous system? What do we, uh, axons outside the central nervous system we call nerves. Cell bodies outside the central nervous system, we call, no, not tracts, we call them ganglion. They're going to be clustered together in a ganglion. So our first multipolar neuron basically goes from the lateral gray horn to the second autonomic neuron and it synapses in the ganglion. And since it synapses in the ganglion, we call this first motor neuron the preganglionic the preganglionic neuron. So our preganglionic neuron starts in the central nervous system, starts in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord comes out and synapses on our second in that ganglion. It releases acetylcholine. That acetylcholine has an excitatory effect. And it stimulates our second neuron. And if our first neuron is called the preganglionic neuron, guess what our second neuron is called? Postganglionic neuron. Again, it is still a motor neuron. So it is still multipolar. And again, its cell body is in the autonomic ganglion and its axon, the post ganglionic neuron, I'm just going to go post GN for space, is actually unmyelinated. It has an unmyelinated axon and its unmyelinated axon travels to the effector. And of course, here our effectors are going to be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. These are our possible effectors. So obviously, we have a second neuron here. That is something that is different. The last thing that is different is that this postganglionic neuron some release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter and some release a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. Anyone know the other name of norepinephrine? Norepinephrine chemically is almost identical to epinephrine. So we have these two hormones in our body, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But these two hormones have another name they're commonly known by. Anybody know the other name? There you go. Adrenaline and noradrenaline. Exactly. So some postganglionic neurons are going to release acetylcholine and some are going to release norepinephrine. 
And some of the effects are going to be excitatory. And some of the effects will be inhibitory. So notice our autonomic pathway is a little bit more complicated. Nope, a, a great question. Uh, so again, this one was sent privately to me, so I'll read the whole thing to everyone so you get this. I'm a bit confused by the naming of things. Uh, so you say the cluster of cell bodies are called a ganglion. So when it's post-ganglionic, does that mean it's alone? No, it doesn't mean that it's alone. It is still in the ganglion. Think of it back to when we were talking about a synapse. Remember when we talked about a synapse, we have the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. So the first one was pre and the second one was post. It's the same thing here. We have one that feeds into the ganglion and one that feeds out of the ganglion. So one's axon goes into the ganglion. The one whose axon goes into the ganglion is the preganglionic neuron. The second one's axon leaves the ganglion, so it is the postganglionic neuron. I've done it all with words here. Normally I do it with a pretty picture, but I actually have a pretty picture from the textbook. Maybe if we look from the, at the pretty picture from the textbook, that will help to make some sense of this. Let me go ahead and save this picture here so that we can uh, take a look at that on our whiteboard later. But let's switch back and clear this and talk about the, and look at the pretty picture from the lecture and see if that makes some sense. All right, so if we got all the writing here, hopefully you guys have all written this down as well. And let's take a look at the pretty picture now. As I mentioned, our differences between our somatic and our autonomic pathways are there effectors, right? Skeletal muscle, so in simple terms, it's either skeletal muscle for our motor or it's smooth cardiac muscles and glands are the effectors for our autonomic pathways. Notice in that anatomical pathway, our somatic is one neuron, and in our autonomic, it is two neurons. Neurotransmitters in our somatic, I'll just put S now, it's ACH only, whereas in our autonomic, it can be ACH or in some cases, uh, norepinephrine, and now that we've Spelled out norepinephrine once, we can put NE now for abbreviation for norepinephrine. Oh, and there's a pretty words there. Also, they can be different in their effect. In somatic, it's always excitatory, whereas in our autonomic, it can sometimes be excitatory and sometimes be inhibitory. Again, we've done it here with the words, but let's look at the pretty pictures. Here is the pathway we are comfortable and familiar with. We have a single neuron whose cell body starts in the anterior gray horn. Axon comes out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. Notice it is myelinated. It travels the whole the way to the effector where it releases acetylcholine. And as we talked about, when it releases that acetylcholine, it is always sedatory. Again, no new information here. Here we see the pretty picture that went with all the words we wrote on the last time. And this one was pretty straightforward, so it wasn't quite as scary. But let's look at this one. With our autonomic, remember our effector is gonna be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glands. Some will release acetylcholine, but some can release norepinephrine. They can also release epinephrine and norepinephrine into our blood, giving us that big global stress response. And sometimes it can be excitatory or sometimes it can be inhibitory. And again, I don't mean that on Mondays it's excitatory and on Tuesdays it's inhibitory. What I mean is that when it innervates the heart, for instance, when we're having that stress response, we want it to be excitatory. We want our heart to beat faster. However, the same time you're stressed, what happens to the saliva production in your mouth? It increases, it's inhibited. So that same stress pathway to the mouth may inhibit the salivary gland. And here's the picture. Notice here we see a picture of what I was trying to describe in words. Notice we have two neurons. We have our preganglionic neuron. 
Its cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. And again, they cheated a little bit. It should be out here a little bit more in the lateral gray horn. Its axon, again, out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. Notice this preganglionic neurons myelinated. But notice it doesn't go all the way to the effectors. Instead, it synapses on our autonomic ganglia, where it releases acetylcholine always and where it is always excitatory. Our postganglionic neurons, cell bodies located in that autonomic ganglion, because after all, a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies, so it's in here with dozens of its friends. It's still a motor neuron, so it's still multipolar, just like this one's multipolar. And its maxon, which happens to be unmyelinated, travels from the ganglion to the effectors, where it can release either acetylcholine, whoops, either acetylcholine or norepinephrine, and some are inhibitory and some are excitatory. Some. So that same norepinephrine, which is being released to make the heart beat faster, that same norepinephrine may make the salivary gland release less saliva. So in one place, it's going to be excitatory, and in the other place, it's going to be inhibitory. So notice here, we've done with the pretty picture what I try to do with the words. So does this help you to identify the pre- and post-ganglionic neurons a little bit better when you see them visually this way? Excellent. All righty. So that is our main difference between our autonomic and our somatic motor pathways. And I think I have one more. No, great question. It is not excitatory or inhibitory at the same time. Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by at the same time. So again, think of it this way. We have many autonomic pathways. Here in the pretty picture, you can think of, in simplest terms, we have three. One that goes to skeletal uh, cardiac muscle, one that goes to smooth muscle, and one that goes to a particular gland. The one that goes to the um, cardiac muscle may release norepinephrine, and when it releases norepinephrine, it's always going to be excitatory. However, a different pathway of autonomic pathway is going to go to your salivary gland. And when that same norepinephrine is released in that pathway, it's inhibitory in its effect. Right? With skeletal muscle, all the pathways to every single muscle, when you stimulate that muscle, when you release that neurotransmitter, that muscle contracts. They're always excitatory. That is not the case here. In fact, spoiler, we have two pathways to our cardiac muscle. We have our parasympathetic and our sympathetic. Our sympathetic, of course, is going to be our fight or flight response. And as I'm sure you know, what effect would we, our fight and flight response want to have on the heart? Would we want to increase heart rate or decrease heart rate? Increase, excellent, All right? And again, not surprising, which of the two neurotransmitters do you think it releases, acetylcholine or norepinephrine? Which is essentially, well, but remember, norepinephrine is essentially epinephrine, which is essentially adrenaline. And which one makes the heart beat faster, acetylcholine or adrenaline? There you go, absolutely. It's gonna release norepinephrine and it's gonna be excitatory, all right? It's gonna release norepinephrine and it's gonna be excitatory. Oops. However, at the same time, we have a parasympathetic pathway. That parasympathetic pathway is what you're using your rest and digest, and it's going to want to decrease heart rate. So our parasympathetic pathway, is it going to want to release norepinephrine to the heart? No, it's going to use acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter, and the acetylcholine is going to inhibit.
the cardiac muscle, get it to beat slower. So notice when you say, can it be excitatory and inhibitory at the same time? Notice our parasympathetic is always going to be inhibitory to the heart. But if instead we're talking about going to the smooth muscle of the stomach, well then parasympathetic is going to be excitatory and sympathetic is going to be inhibitory. So we can release different neurotransmitters and they can have different effects. And we'll talk about this in much more depth. All right, does that help at least a little bit? Cool. Now, notice again, here is a different illustration that shows this exact same information. Again, here is our somatic, our somatic nervous system starting in the central nervous system, one neuron all the way to the effector, myelinated axon, releases acetylcholine, always excitatory. Here, we see our autonomic pathways. Notice two neurons, a preganglionic neuron that is always myelinated, always starts in the central nervous system, and always communicates with a ganglion. And a postganglionic neuron that is unmyelinated that goes to the effector and releases either norepinephrine or acetylcholine on our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our glands. And on some of these effectors, it'll be excitatory. And on others of these effectors, they'll be inhibitory. And notice we also talked about our sympathetic stimulates our adrenal gland to release that adrenaline or epinephrine into the blood to give us that big global effect. So here in our autonomic, we see a two neuron pathway. But notice here we see something else that our sympathetic pathway and our parasympathetic pathways are gonna be slightly different as well. And so while all of our autonomics are different from our somatic, all of them have two ganglion in their process. If we notice, there are gonna be anatomical differences in our parasympathetic and our sympathetic that we're gonna to have to describe as well. And that's what we're gonna do next. Let's talk about our two principal divisions sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? Again, I've used it many times. We've talked about it many times. Our sympathetic, typically we talk about that fight or flight type of reaction, right? That bear with an ax walks in the room and you have two choices, fight that bear with an ax or outrun somebody in the room. And our parasympathetic, we often refer to as our rest and digest. These cutesy little mnemonics are easy because they're uh, easy to remember, but they're not technically very useful. I, I would say fight and flight is a good definition for um, fight and flight is a good definition of the sympathetic pathway because our sympathetic pathway is really about mobilizing our resources to deal with stress. Stress from an evolutionary, from a biological standpoint is a life and death situation. And if you're in that life or death situation, you are in that fight or flight situation. Parasympathetic is more about storing those resources, right? Or uh, what I like to commonly think of it is, is it's our housekeeping processes. And again, rest and digest are certainly parts of that, but I don't think it does as good of a job of talking about what it does. But those are decent starting points, so let's start with that. Now, the other thing to remember is that most organs of our body, or at least most effectors, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, get a dual innervation, right? Classic example of this is your heart. That is, of course, the precise anatomical uh, appearance of what a human heart looks like. And in most cases, we get innervation to our effectors from both our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. Oops. 
we get dual innervation from both. Why would it be useful to get dual innervation from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic? Right, more, and even more precisely, it gives us precision of control, right? How many people just have an air conditioner, just have a heater in your house? All right, if you live here in Sacramento, you probably have both. Because if you want to keep precise control of the temperature of your house, you need both. Right now, you can get away most days with the windows open and, you know, just let the minor fluctuations that are going on. But a month from now, are you going to want that air conditioner to be able to bring the temperature down every time it goes up? Absolutely. And you're going to say, well, I just have that air conditioner. I don't need anything else. But what happens when December rolls around again? Is that air conditioner going to do you a lot of good then? No, you need your heater to be able to bring it back up. The advantage of dual innervation is it gives us precise control. Our sympathetic is going to increase heart rate. Our parasympathetic is going to decrease heart rate. And so this way, we can precisely control what our heart rate is going to be. We can precisely control the activity of our stomach. We can precisely control most of the organs our visceral organs, because most of them have this dual control. Of course, what is the key word I keep saying again and again and again in that statement? Most, absolutely, because most is not all. There are some exceptions. There are some organs uh, that don't receive dual innervation. And the good news is most of them make sense. <coughs> Hold on, let me undo my drawings here. In most cases, when there's dual innervation, there is going to be constant input from both branches. So there is constant parasympathetic input to your heart, constant sympathetic uh, input to your heart. However, while there's constant input, it will not always be equal. When you're running up those three flights of stairs, you're going to have more input from the sympathetic nervous system. When you're sitting there at that yoga class, right, and you're in the lotus position and you've got your eyes closed and you're humming, right, or in that meditation class, you're getting more parasympathetic input. So there is constant input, and that constant input is what we call autonomic tone. But constant input doesn't mean that the two inputs are always the same one is usually going to be higher than the other. All right. Now, as I said, most, but not all, there are some exceptions. And those exceptions basically just get input from the sympathetic nervous system. And most of these make sense. Let's see some examples. The adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is, of course, responsible for releasing adrenaline into our blood to deal with a stress situation. So we get a global stress response. Is there any reason for our adrenal gland to be innervated by our parasympathetic nervous system? No. We only need that adrenaline when we're dealing with that stress response, and it is sympathetic only. That makes some semblance of sense. It turns out our skin is innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system as well, right? When we are active, our sweat glands become active to help us to regulate temperature. When we are cold or when we're scared, right, that stress response, our rectal pili muscles are going to stand up on end and our blood vessels to our skin are also, so controlling and regulating blood flow. Remember, if we exercise, we wanna dilate those blood vessels, bring blood to the surface to release that heat. When we're embarrassed, we increase blood flow to our face, right, our skin there. When we are stressed, we constrict the blood vessels in our skin, we get pale as you're getting ready to go up and give that big, huge talk that you have to give in front of the class. So our skin is innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system. And in fact, most of our blood vessels are as well. There is really only one exception, and it's a very interesting one. 
There is only one set of blood vessels. that are controlled by the parasympathetic. Nervous system. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but you're aware of it. Back in ancient times, we didn't have to stay six feet away from everybody. So you may have that guy that you're sweet on and you take him out for that very important third date. When you take him out for that nice third date, you take him to a nice restaurant, you buy him a nice meal. And of course, if you're anything like me, when you spend that kind of money on a guy, you expect something in return. Of course, he knows that. And so he may be a little bit nervous about it. And if he happens to be a little too nervous, right, performance could be an issue. And the reason for that is the only blood vessels that are controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system are the ones that uh, bring blood to the erectile tissue. This is, of course, the penis in the male. This is the clitoris and the labia in the female. Arousal is actually a parasympathetic reflex. Right? That's why when you're stressed, right? Performance could be an issue. Being able to, uh, to obtain and maintain rigidity can be an issue if the male is nervous, right, about that third date. So, of course, the best thing to do is do what I do, apply him with alcohol. He'll be much more relaxed, and then you can get what you need from him. All right? So that is the only exception. Those are the only blood vessels that are not controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. Arousal is a parasympathetic reflex. And again, most of these make sense. The one organ that does not have dual innervation that doesn't make sense, at least on the surface, is the kidney. When you think of the function of the kidney, I know everybody thinks, oh, it makes urine. Right? That is the function of the kidney. That's not really the function of the kidney. It, it is, but is making the appropriate urine what is vitally important for your body? No, absolutely not. You've got it. The job of the kidney, the real job of the kidney, is to filter your blood, making sure your blood is appropriate, making sure it has the right number of nutrients, removing toxins, things like that. All the things your body doesn't need, yeah, it gets removed as urine, but the goal isn't to make the urine. The goal is to filter the blood. And how vitally important is the filtering of that blood? Hugely, exactly, very important. And again, think of it in this terms, right? Life for the most part is lazy. It does just enough to get by, right? Could you survive with one eyeball instead of two in your head? Yeah, but you probably couldn't be a professional pitcher, right? Your depth perception might be a little bit off. What about one lung? Could you survive with one lung? Yeah, but could you be a track star with just one lung? No, you probably wouldn't be able to get enough oxygen and nutrients or oxygen uh, to the muscles to be able to sprint for a living. But what about a kidney? Could you give up a kidney and be a professional athlete, a world-class football player or sprinter or pitcher or any of those things? Absolutely. Now, in fairness, you might not want to be a professional football player if you only had one kidney. Because if you damage that remaining kidney, then you're screwed. But one kidney can do everything your body needs to be able to filter your blood. Having a second kidney is a tremendous redundancy. It's an important redundancy, but it's a redundancy. So again, in these hard times, if you want to sell a kidney on eBay, right, you have the opportunity to do that. You would survive just fine with just one. But with none, your prognosis is pretty horrible. You will last days if both kidneys failed or you sold both of them because you were, you know, really needed the money or something. I don't know. Um, again, uh, dialysis is a short-term solution for kidney failure, but it's not a long-term solution. What your kidneys do are vitally important. And I think that's where we kind of understand this lack of dual innervation. If filtering your blood, which definitely sounds like a housekeeping, right? This sounds more housekeeping-like. than it does dealing with stress. But 
if filtering your blood is that vitally important, do I really need my parasympathetic nervous system to be going, come on, kidney, filter that blood, you can do it? No, it needs to be doing it all the time. In fact, while you're sitting here calmly in your chair listening to the soothing tones of my voice, about 25% of your blood is passing through your kidney every minute. You have a massive blood flow to your kidney, and that massive blood flow keeps a nice high pressure in your kidney so that it can filter the blood properly. But then we take our 10 minute break. And like me, I'm sure you're racing downstairs from your office down into the kitchen to grab with, uh, some caffeine and then racing back up the stairs. And as you're running up and down those stairs, is 25% of your blood still going to your kidneys? No. So does that mean that every time you get up and walk around or every time you run, less blood goes to your kidneys so your kidneys are going to function less efficiently? That would be a really bad thing. So when you're active, when you're using your sympathetic nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system stimulates the kidney to keep the kidney at high pressure so that even though there's less blood going to it, it still can properly filter the blood. So when that blood is, uh, when blood is going to other parts of the body, we still need to be able to filter what's left. And our sympathetic nervous system helps us to do that. So while going to the kidneys doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, it actually does. And we'll actually talk a lot about that autonomic regulation when we get to the urinary system in 431. All right. So there you go. Those are, where are we time-wise? Those are our... Um, organs that do not receive dual innervation. Every other smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and gland that you could think of receives dual innervation from both sympathetic and parasympathetic. These are the exceptions. Oh, come on. There. Excellent. All right. Now, when we talk about these pathways, sympathetic and parasympathetic, there are two ways to think about them. There, we can think about their structure and we can talk about their function. And so what I think is more intuitive makes more sense to most people is to talk about the function of the pathways. And of course, when we talk about the function of the pathways, we are talking about the physiology. All right. A bear with an ax walks in your room right now, and how does your body respond to it physiologically? Right? Again, we're gonna have that fight or flight response, that life or death situation. A bear with an ax has walked, in, walked into the room. So if you think about the things that happen, your pupils dilate when you're stressed. Right? Back in ancient times, we didn't have nice houses that we lived in, we lived out in the woods. Right? And bear with axes are sneaky. Right, uh, So you need to open up your eyes, let more light in so you can more ably perceive where that bear with an ax is so that you are able to uh, see where it is and know where you need to run for safety. Your heart doesn't just beat faster, but it also beats stronger as well. Not only does your heart rate go up, but you can feel it pounding against your chest. Right, And of course, that increases your blood pressure, increasing blood flow throughout the body. Your airways dilate, right? And again, notice as we learn and understand these processes, we use them to our advantage. I'm sure I mentioned it in the class before we had to leave the classroom and come back here. I have two daughters and as I've mentioned before, one of them has a severe peanut and tree nut allergy. So back in ancient times when we were able to leave our houses, every time I left the house, I would always have an EpiPen with me, right? I would have that epinephrine that adrenaline, so that if she had an anaphylactic shock, I could give her that jolt of adrenaline, right? Anaphylactic shock, what happens, two important things happen with an anaphylactic shock when someone has an allergic reaction. One is you get a massive dilation of your peripheral blood vessels. A lot of peripheral blood vessels dilate and the blood pressure drops. And if your blood pressure drops, you can't get blood to your brain. And that's a bad thing. The other thing that happens is the mucous membranes of your airway start to increase their mucus production. They start to swell, restricting your airflow. So now not only can you get blood to your brain, but you can't get oxygen into your lungs either, right? And it can kill you. So what do you do? 
You give her that shot of adrenaline, increases the heart rate, increases the force of the contraction, blood pressure comes back up, helping to get the blood back to the brain, and it dilates the smooth muscles of the airway. So even though the mucous membranes are thickening, the airways hopefully open up so that they can get that air in so that they're able to survive that anaphylactic shock. Right? Blood vessels are going to change, but again, it depends on which blood vessels we're talking about blood vessels to our digestive system, blood vessels to our skin, those are non-essential organs. Those are going to constrict, right? You're, as we talked about, part of the coloration of your skin is blood flowing to it. When you're embarrassed, there's an increase in blood flow. When you're stressed, when you're scared, those blood vessels constrict because we want to send the blood to other locations. And so typically someone gets very pale when they're scared, when they're stressed, right? Uh, digestion decreases. That's why you're not supposed to swim until uh, at least a half an hour after you've eaten because you have that big, huge cheeseburger for breakfast and then you instantly start doing laps in the pool. All the blood's going to be going to muscles in another area and you stop sending money, money up, uh, sorry, you stop sending blood to your digestive system. You don't completely break down those fats. You don't completely break down those uh, proteins. And as a result of that, you can get intestinal discomfort and even cramping. And if you're a half mile out to sea swimming, Cramping is not the thing you want to have happening. But blood vessels that help you to use that energy, those are going to dilate. We increase blood vessels, bringing blood back to the heart, sending blood to the oxygen to get to the, I mean, to the lungs to get the oxygen, sending it to the skeletal muscles so that we can be physically active. And here's the other one we don't think about. It sends blood to the liver and the adipose to release those nutrients. Because again, stress is fight or flight. Stress is bear with axis. Or at least that's what it used to be. All right? Stress used to be bear with axis. They roam the countrysides in big, huge herds. Now you hardly see any anymore. And now, before, stress were life and death types of situations. Now stress is that 10-page paper you have due. Or that stress is that tiny little pathogen that is running around outside of your house. And how do you deal with those things? You sit at your computer and you type, or you sit in front of the TV and you stare at the TV. Now the problem is the things that stress us still cause these same biological changes, including increasing blood flow to our uh, resource supplies. The problem is if you deal with that stress by typing on a computer or sitting in front of a TV, especially if you're eating while you're sitting in front of that TV, you're not using all that glucose and all those triglycerides that are being released into your blood. And so you've got all these resources in your blood that aren't being used. So what happens to them? It's stored as fat. I was glorious before I had kids, right? Beautiful. I, I, I was a work of art. And then got married, had kids. Now I've lost my hair. I'm fat. Stress is horrible for your body, right? Worst thing you can possibly do for your body physiologically is have a family. Horrible, horrible things. Absolutely. They're the worst. Um, but all kidding aside, the things that stress us now are not the same things that stress us evolutionarily. And so typically stress mobilizes those resources because stress was life or death situations that needed to be dealt with physically. Um, it can be better, so quick, great question. So is it better to work out when stressed? It can't be stressed, it can help to alleviate that stress to help to reduce those symptoms of the stress. But the problem is what's causing the stress. If the stress is that you have a 10 page paper due on Friday and every time, time you think about it, you get stressed and so you jump on the treadmill, then Friday's gonna keep getting closer and closer and you're not gonna be working on that project and so that doesn't help that way. But after spending an hour or two writing that paper, then could spending 15 or 20 minutes on the exercise bike help you or vice versa, do the exercise and then come and work? Sure, absolutely. Uh, stress can't, chronic stress can cause some people to lose weight uh, because again, it, uh, that extreme stress, chronic stress can affect appetite. And so typically what happens is those individuals typically are malnourished and they lose weight that way. But a lot of times when they lose that weight from the chronic stress, it's typically more your fat, uh, pardon me, your muscle that is being broken down than it is your fat, uh, what's being broken down. Our, our muscle is much more dynamic that way and when you're being malnourished, when you're being undernourished, your body responds to that by holding on to fat. Fat is a valuable resource, so it wants to hold on to it. 
right? So you lose, it slows down your metabolism. Uh, you're more likely to break down f uh, muscle than you are fat. And so, yes, it is possible that you can lose weight, but I'm not encouraging you to stretch yourself out to try to, you know, fit into your bikini for, uh, you know, for summer, which is right around the corner. And so, like I said, that blood flow increases to the liver and adipose to release those resources, to release that fuel into the blood so that it can be used for dealing with that fight or flight physiological stress response. And like I said, because it's not going to the non-essential organs, digestive activity decreases. We see that in the cramping that we talked about. But also the other example that I like using is when someone's stressed because they have to stand up and talk in front of the class. One of the things that happens as a result of that is your palms get sweaty because it affects your skin, right? Your blood vessels constrict, you get pale, but your mouth gets all dry because again, by decreasing the digestive activity, we decrease saliva production. So now you have to stand up in front of the class and you've got, you know, and you've got uh, sandpaper in your throat uh, and on your tongue because of the lack of moisture from that as well. I think a lot of these physiological responses, most of us have experienced to one level or another. I think the physiology of the autonomic nervous system is something that makes much more sense to people. It's much more intuitive. It's much more straightforward. I don't think there's really any big surprises on the screen right now, right? And the other thing that I would say is that, um, are we on time? Doing good. Excellent. Because, and this is the other part, I think we should have probably mentioned this before, but this is a good thing to say now. When we talk about that dual innervation, the two systems are always antagonistic. Are always antagonistic. What that means is that if the sympathetic is excitatory, the parasympathetic is going to be inhibitory. If the sympathetic is inhibitory, the parasympathetic is going to be excitatory. Now, antagonistic is a fancy way of saying that they're always going to be the opposite of each other. So when we think about the physiology of these two systems, well, if our sympathetic increases heart rate, then guess what our parasympathetic does? Decreases heart rate. If our sympathetic dilates the airways, whoops, guess what our parasympathetic does? Constricts the airways, absolutely. So when we think of the physiology, when we think of everything that the sympathetic does, if you just think of the opposite, right, constricts the pupils, lowers the heart rate, constricts the airways, it does the opposite. And that is a perfectly acceptable way to think of them, right? There are some other better mnemonics than rest and digest that help us to understand our physiology. Again, this, as we talked about, is that housekeeping type of process. And one of them is SLUD. Our parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for digestion. So not surprisingly, that includes digestion, but also saliva production and also defecation. Urination is part of the housekeeping process. Lacrimation, what the heck's lacrimation? Tears, absolutely, tear formation, absolutely. So all of these are processes, the sluds of salvation, uh, lacrimation, urination, digestion, and defecation. Uh, another important uh, way to talk about this is to think of the three big decreases of the parasympathetic nervous system. It decreases the heart rate, it decreases the diameter of the airways, and it decreases the pupils. I have a student who uh, now is a nurse on the front lines, uh, working hard in one of our local hospitals. Uh, she took me many years ago for both 430 and 431. Uh, we stayed in contact after she went to nursing school, and now she's out in the field. And her and her, at that time, boyfriend, uh, now husband, uh, has a cabin up in Tahoe. And during the two semesters that she was with me, uh, EMTs were called not once, not twice, but three times to their cabin up in the woods because one of the things that her boyfriend loved to do was to walk around the woods up in Tahoe and eat wild mushrooms. And on three occasions, he ate the wrong types of mushrooms. 
the poisonous types of mushrooms. And those poisonous types of mushrooms are poisonous by stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you think about what happens, it causes you to produce massive saliva, your tears run, uh, your heart rate goes down, your airway decreases, your pupils constrict. Doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, and they had to call the EMT three times on it happened. All I can figure is these mushrooms must be delicious if he's still willing to do it for three things. You don't necessarily pee yourself. It isn't gonna cause you to urinate or defecate yourself necessarily as a response to that. Uh, but uh, the saliva and tear production, uh, the de and these three big decreases are really the big one, right? Lowering your heart rate and then constricting your airways. Those are really the ones that are gonna do you in. But like I said, he did survive. They have since been married. Uh, and like I said, they must be really yummy uh, mushrooms is all I can figure. Remember, there is that arousal we talked about, engorgement of the penis, engorgement of the erectile tissue of the clitoris and the labia. Uh, that is a parasympathetic response. And your book's got a great table that talks about all of the physiology. And like I said, the good news is I think the physiology is pretty intuitive. Uh, so, uh, great question. So, you are correct. And here's one of the things we're going to talk about. So, we, here's a good thing to talk about it as well. Let me get rid of that table part because this will give us some room. Obviously, as we see, there are some differences in the physiology, the functions of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. But there's one other big physiological difference between them. And that is our sympathetic effects are global, right? Our sympathetic effects are global. When that bear with an ax walks in the room, you don't want just your heartbeat increasing or your heart rate increasing and then five minutes later your airways open and two minutes after that your eyes dilate and three minutes after that more blood is going to your skin. With our sympathetic nervous system, we want big global responses. With our parasympathetic nervous system, here the effects are small, they're local, right? When you go, again, back in ancient times, we used to be able to go out to restaurants, Mother's Day right around the corner, so you take mom to Ruth Chris, that nice restaurant for that great steak dinner. And as they bring that beautiful looking steak out and with the herb butter just melting on the top of that, right? You start to salivate as a result of it, right? You don't urinate when they bring that steak out. You don't defecate. You don't even cry, right? You may cry when they bring you the bill a little bit later, but our parasympathetic nervous system effects are local. They're small local effects and our sympathetic, our big global, where we want them all happening at once. And we're gonna actually see that in the anatomy. When we look at the pathways, the pathways of these, uh, for the sympathetic has many branches because it is going lots of different locations and has very many effects. Whereas in our parasympathetic, it is very discrete innervation. So very local pathways. Again, storing energy is another mnemonic. It isn't uh, obviously, uh, you know, um, oh, so I spelled discrete correctly. Um, again, producing saliva directly doesn't store energy, but if you think about it, it's related to our digestive system and digestive system is about getting energy into our body. Right. So again, it, it, these th terms like housekeeping, terms like storing energy are kind of general rules of thumb, right, of how they is kind of, a, you know, a, a general term to help us to understand and think about all of the specific effects that are associated with it. All right. But obviously it, it, it doesn't encompass everything. All right. So, like I said, uh, we'll see this difference in the global and the local when we look at the anatomy of these, which is what we're going to do next. But this is a good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our next break here. My watch says 226. 
So that return and restart at uh, 2.36. And I will restart, oh, let's start recording. At that time. All right, any other questions before we take our next break? Uh, it, it can, so yeah, our parasympathetic uh, doesn't necessarily, well, it depends. It slows the metabolism of the heart, so the heart beats slower, but it increases the metabolism of the digestive system. Right, so again, it, you can't think of them in global terms. Think of them as each one is an individual physiological effect. And like I said, your book has a nice table talking about all the physiological effects of these that we've lifted as well. So again, if these general terms, if these mnemonics don't help you, then just memorize the list of all the things that they do. All right, let's go ahead and take our break. 10 minutes, meet you back here at, uh, we'll go at 2.37. All right. And So, like I said, I think the physiology of this is pretty intuitive. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the anatomy is not quite as much. Uh, so let's talk about that next. Here, we see that first picture that we talked about when we discussed our autonomic pathways. We know this autonomic pathway involves two neurons. We know those neurons are a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. We know our preganglionic neuron is myelinated, where our postganglionic neuron is unmyelinated. We know our preganglionic neuron starts in the central nervous system and it is going to synapse at the ganglion. And we know our postganglionic neuron starts in the ganglion and it synapses at the effector. Oops. These are things that we already talked about and identified when we were describing our autonomic pathway. So all of these things are consistent, all of these things are true for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic pathways. So we have those two neurons, a preganglionic and a postganglionic, myelinated, unmyelinated, starts in the central nervous system, synapses of the ganglia, starts at the ganglia, synapses on the effector. We've talked about all of that. However, as we've already hinted at, and now we're gonna even more elaborate on, there are really three big differences in our sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways. The first is the location of the cell bodies, where exactly in the central nervous system they're located, what structures are formed by their axons, the amount of branching, how elaborate is their branching or how discrete is their branching, and the third, even though I don't see it on here and I don't think it's gonna sneak in, so I will write it here nice and big, uh, the third big difference is the neuro transmitter used by the uh, postganglionic neuron. That is the third big difference, which neurotransmitter is released, so let's say released instead of used, by the postganglionic neuron. So those are gonna be our three big differences. So let's look at our two pathways individually so we can see these characteristics or start to see these characteristics. Ah, there it is, neurotransmitter released. I thought that should be there. Excellent. Here is our sympathetic pathway. Notice one of the first things that should stand out as we talked about is that both are pre and post ganglionic neurons branch elaborately 
and form many synapses. This is how we get that big global effect, big elaborate branches in both the pre and the post ganglionic neurons. But there's another big difference that we see in these two pathways as far as their anatomy as well. In our sympathetic pathways, these ganglion, the ganglia, plural, are close in proximity to the central nervous system. So these ganglion are close to the central nervous system. What that means is that our preganglionic axons are short because they don't have to travel as far, and our postganglionic axons are long. So not only are they unmyelinated, but they're long. Not only are these myelinated, but they are short. All right. <clears throat> Lastly, neurotransmitter. Most, and again, there's that key word. What does most mean? It means not all, exactly. It means not all, most, but not all of our postganglionic release norepinephrine but there is a few that release acetylcholine. And so that's what we see here in this illustration. Notice I think I've kept it all my stuff low enough where we can still see, well, except these gonna be a problem. Preganglionic neurons are short, postganglionic neurons are long, and the ganglia are close in proximity to the central nervous system. So again, our preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, our postganglionic neurons most release norepinephrine, and a few release acetylcholine. These are the characteristics that are unique to our sympathetic pathways. Compare this to what we see in our parasympathetic pathway. Notice in this case, one of the first things that should stand out is that both the pre and post ganglionic axons do not branch elaborately. Instead, they are very discrete. and they form few synapses. Again, remember with this one, we get much more local effects. You can cry without salivating at the mouth. All right? So much more discrete in their activations, in their number of synapses they form. Notice also in this case, our ganglia, are very close to, or sometimes even in the walls of our effectors. So for instance, the parasympathetic ganglion of the stomach is actually in the stomach. So if you think about it, this preganglionic axon then not only is myelinated, but it is very long because it basically travels all the way to the stomach. And if you're already in the wall of the stomach, then your postganglionic axon is gonna be very short. It is much closer to the organ, and so it is much shorter as a result of that.
And lastly, as we talked about, the big difference is going to be in their neurotransmitters. And here in our parasympathetic pathway, all of our pre and our post ganglionic neurons all release acetylcholine. Remember, we did say all of our, uh, pardon, we did say acetylcholine was the most common neurotransmitter in the peripheral nervous system. So here in our parasympathetic pathway, all of our neurons release acetylcholine. Even this isn't really totally new information for us because if you remember back when we first saw this chart, it hinted at differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Notice it doesn't show the branching. Remember this one, both sides we have elaborate. And that's part of what gives us that global effect, right? Many synapses. But we do see that the ganglion are closer to the central nervous system than the effectors, and that most are going to release norepinephrine or through the adrenal gland, release norepinephrine and epinephrine into the blood. Our parasympathetic, its ganglion is closer to the effectors. Of course, it doesn't see here that we, doesn't see, we don't see the discrete innervation, right? The discrete branching. But we see that they always release acetylcholine. Now, this is one way to look at these pathways. But another way to look at these pathways is something like this. I know when you first look at this, this is going to look like an octopus that is going to be uh, live in your nightmares for years to come. And it is a bit intimidating when you first look at these. There are many different versions of these. I have several of them in my lecture. There are several more you'll find online and things along those lines. But when you actually spend some time and look at them, you will actually see just how elegant this system really is. This illustration really does an amazing job of showing us the relationship of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. For starters, notice they all start in the central nervous system but they don't all start in the same location in the central nervous system, right? Here our sympathetic is on uh, the central region, whereas here our parasympathetic is more superior and more inferior. Notice they show two neuron pathways. Here we see a dark neuron, which starts in the central nervous system and synapses on a second neuron, presumably in a ganglion. And that ganglion happens to be right next to an effector like the eye. So our preganglionic axon is shorter than our postganglionic axon on the parasympathetic side. Notice on the sympathetic side, our ganglia are much closer to the central nervous system. So our preganglionic axon, that dark green in this case, is much shorter, and our postganglionic is much longer. Notice also there's a lot more pathways. If I'm gonna to get to the eye, notice there's only one way to get to the eye. If I'm gonna to get to the salivary glands, there's only one way to get to the salivary glands. Notice if I want to get to the heart, I could start here and come down and go to the heart. I could start all the way down here and come up and go to the heart. I have many paths I can take to get to the heart from this. And notice even in the effectors, Notice skin, for instance, is over here on the sympathetic side, but not over here on the parasympathetic side. Because as we talked about, skin is one of those structures that does not receive the dual innervation, right? The kidney should be over here, right? Should be over here as well. And uh, the adrenal gland is over here, but it is not over here. So we're already starting to see some of the things that we have learned about our autonomic nervous system when we look at this monstrosity of an image. And again, we're going to start over here on the parasympathetic because the parasympathetic, by being discrete, is much more um, local effects, local non-branching discrete branches. And so the pathways are much more clear. 
And that's what we see. Notice we can take this, which shows both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, but we can also take it and just look at the parasympathetic. And that is what we see here. Now notice the parasympathetic from an anatomical standpoint, where's my, there it is. Uh, from an anatomical standpoint, it is referred to as the craniosacral branch of the autonomic nervous system. And if we look at this picture, or we look at the previous picture, we can see why. Let's go back to the previous picture first. Notice all of the parasympathetic pathways either come off the sacral portion of the spinal cord, or they actually come off of the brain stem. And if they come off the brain stem, lo and behold, I see Roman numerals. These are cranial nerves. So our parasympathetic nervous system basically has two starting points. It either comes out our cranial nerves or it comes off the sacral portion of our spinal cord. And so because it either comes out of our cranial nerves or it comes off the sacral portion of our spinal cord, it is referred to anatomically as the craniosacral branch of the autonomic nervous system. Notice two neurons. Here, the red one, the preganglionic neuron, starts either in the brain stem or in the spinal cord, the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. Comes, its axon comes out. Notice there can be some branching, some overlapping, and notice they're going to synapse on a postganglionic neuron. And most of these are right at or actually inside the organs. Here, are a couple ganglion that actually get names, but most of them don't have names because they're right at or actually in the organ. Then we have our black postganglionic neuron that goes to our effector and affects either the eye or the tears or saliva or the heart or the lungs or the kidneys and so on and so forth. So what we have here is a beautiful illustration that does a nice job of showing us this pathway. Now, you are of course gonna be responsible for these pathways and I certainly don't expect you, even if we were in the classroom, I wouldn't expect you to be able to draw these pathways. That isn't something you would necessarily need to do. But because it is straightforward with the parasympathetic, it's pretty easy to write out. So let's do that. Let's switch from the pretty picture. We'll come back to the pretty pictures at the end, but let's switch from the pretty pictures and go back to our whiteboard. I need you up here. There we go. And then I can clear all of that. So what we are going to do is we are going to draw, right, pardon me, we are going to write out these pathways. These pathways, as we saw from the picture, have steps along the way. Our goal is to, hold on, I'm gonna close that so it's out of my way. We are going to start in the central nervous system. Oops, why are you not writing? Central nervous system. We are going to start in our central nervous system. And again, if you think about it here in the central nervous system, this is where the preganglionic cell body is located, All right? That is our starting point. Our goal is to get to our effector. Now those effectors of course, we know are smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands, but in this case, uh, we are going to need to know our specific pathways that is slightly off. There we go. We are going to actually identify the specific, um, we're gonna uh, identify the specific effector. 
so that we can give the specific pathway. One of the things I could possibly ask for you on the exam is to describe the pathway of the parasympathetic nervous system to a salivary gland or to uh, the lacrimal gland or to the stomach or to the spleen or something along those lines. So we're gonna need to know our precise effector. We also know that somewhere along the way, excuse me, excuse me, we are going to need to know and identify the parasympathetic ganglion. And that is, of course, where the post ganglionic uh, cell body is located. And not only do we need to know where their cell bodies are located, we need to know where their axons are located as well, or what structures formed by those axons. Now, we definitely need to know that for our preganglionic neurons. But as it turns out, we don't really need to worry about that for our postganglionic axon. So if we put a cheat postganglionic neuron axons, remember as we talked about, these ganglion are right at or sometimes inside the effectors. And as such, these branches that come out really don't have names. They're really just parasympathetic axons is all they're really called. They're just parasympathetic nerves. So they're just gonna form parasympathetic nerves. So the short version is for literally everything on the list, that's what this is gonna be. They're gonna be parasympathetic nerves. So it's pretty simple and straightforward. All right, let's draw some quick lines. We can do that. And then let's go through some possible pathways. All right. Now, let's cheat now that we've taken this and drawn this and go back to here for a second. If you notice, there is one, two, three, four possible cranial nerves that are going to be pathways for preganglionic neurons. All right, so take a quick look at these and let's go back to our picture, our chart. So when we're talking about these pathways, what were the cranial nerves that we saw there? Anyone able to mention, identify one of them? I'll tell you what, I'll make the easy part. One was cranial nerve three. Uh, one was cranial nerve seven. One was cranial nerve nine, and the other was cranial nerve 10. Those were the four nerves of that we saw in these pathways. So I've done the easy part by giving you the names of them, and I'm going to scooch these down a little bit so I have a little bit more playroom. So I've given you the number, so that means you get to give me the names. What is the name for cranial nerve three? Excellent, oculomotor. So it is cranial nerve three. And of course, as I mentioned, for all of these cranial nerves, uh, we are, are cell bodies of our preganglionic neuron are going to be in the brainstem of our central nervous system. So one possible pathway, some of these, and again, if they're in the brainstem, if you think about it, they are, the cell bodies are located 
in nuclei, as we talked about, typically in the medulla or uh, some other region of our brainstem. So it's located in the nucleus. Uh, drop my papers. Table back there, out of my way. Excellent. So one possible pathway that we could have is out cranial nerve three, the ocular motor. Remember ocular motors, we talked about controls skeletal muscle that moves the eye, but remember we also talked about how it controls the smooth muscle of the eye as well. And so if it's coming out cranial nerve three, then we know the effector for this is going to be the smooth muscle in the eye. Uh, so, quick question I've got. Uh, are we going over the autonomic nervous system divisions worksheet? Not per se, no. If you've noticed, if you looked at the list, the anatomy is on there as we've been identifying things like preganglionic and postganglionic neurons. I may be indirectly answering some of the questions that are on that handout because there are questions like what do the axons form and things like that along those lines, but I am, per I am not purposely going through that handout. That handout is an independent study guide for you to work out some of these differences. What I am describing to you right now are all of the possible parasympathetic pathways. So if you have an effector in your body that you need to control with your parasympathetic pathway, there are basically essentially six pathways, five pathways that you can take to get there. And that is what I'm describing. I am describing to you an effector of the body and how information gets from your central nervous system to that effector to control it. So if we want to control the smooth muscle of the eye, then what happens is we start with a cell body who's located in the nuclei of the brainstem. Its axon forms cranial nerve three, and it is going to synapse on a ganglion. And if we cheat and go back to our illustration, here's cranial nerve three coming out. Notice the ganglion that it goes to, it synapses on, is called the ciliary ganglia. And notice the postganglionic neuron from that ciliary ganglion goes to the smooth muscle of the eye. So if we go back to our whiteboard, we know that that ocular motor neuron is going to synapse on the ciliary ganglion. And then those parasympathetic nerves, the axons of that, are going to then innervate the smooth muscle of the eye. So this is our pathway of how you control your smooth muscle of your eye, how you're able to change your focus so you can look at the computer screen right now, but you can also look at the window and see that bird that's out on the tree. This is how you can dilate the eye to let more light in when you're in that dark movie theater, or you can constrict your eye when you step outside into that blinding light. This is our parasympathetic pathway to control the smooth muscle of the eye. All right. And again, these are just parasympathetic nerves. I'll put that up here because it's the same for all of them. I'll put this because it's the same for all of them. And again, it's gonna be the same for all of those. All right, that one's pretty simple and straightforward. Things get a little trickier here with cranial nerve seven. What was cranial nerve seven again? Facial, excellent. So again, we are going to start with Neurons whose cells' bodies are located in the nuclei of the central nervous system. Their axons form cranial nerve seven. And that cranial nerve seven is going to synapse on a ganglion. So again, let's cheat by looking back at our illustration to see what ganglion it synapses in. Here's seven. I follow seven out. Uh-oh. Crap. 
seven splits and goes to not, whoops, where's my, oh, there's my mouse, goes to not one, but two different ganglia. So notice there are two different ganglia that are innervated by cranial nerve seven. So basically two different structures that axons from cranial nerve seven can control. Some of the axons go to a ganglion called the pterygopalatine ganglion. And notice it innervates, among other things, your lacrimal gland for tears. The other branch of cranial nerve seven goes to the submandibular ganglion and it innervates a salivary gland. So let's go back and draw that on our chart. One possible pathway involving cranial nerve seven is for it to innervate a parasympathetic ganglion called the pterygo, um, God, even I spell it wrong all the time, hold on, cheat and go back. There, there you go, pterygo palatine. Ganglion. You have to memorize all your cranial nerves. Remember, cranial nerves are going to be probably about 25% of your lab exam. But you need to know the most cranial nerves, and you also need to understand the role that they play in our um, parasympathetic pathways. Yeah, you need to know the pathways. Absolutely you need to know those. And again, if you think about it, when we talked about these cranial nerves, we talked about what their functions were. We talked about what the function of the ocular motor one is, and part of that was controlling smooth muscle. When we talked about facial, I told you we uh, I needed to know that it controls facial muscles, but I also said there was gonna be uh, other functions of them as well, like our lacrimal glands, like other things like that as well. So yes, these are part of the things you need to know about these cranial nerves, yes. Pterygopalatine, and I know I didn't spell that right because that doesn't look right, hold on, what did I do wrong? E T E R Y. Oh, I did spell it right. All right, it looks wrong. Again, there's always going to be those alphabet soup terms you're going to have to spell, uh, and this is definitely going to be one of them. But again, often like these alphabet soup terms, the name is everything about it. Palantine obviously involves the palate, so our pterygopalatine involves things like the mucous membrane. of the nasal cavity. In fact, pterygo, if you think about it, tero means beak. If you think of a pterodactyl, there are two fancy things that everybody remembers about the pterodactyl. They can fly and they have a large beak. Well, the large beak is where they get the name pterodactyl. And it also innervates our lacrimal glands. However, as we also saw, our facial nerve can also innervate a second ganglion. That second ganglion is the submandibular and the submandibular's glands, postganglionic neurons, innervate a salivary gland. You actually have three salivary glands and the submandibular gland is responsible for innervating some of them. But notice the key word there, some of them. If we cheat and go back to our illustration, notice other salivary glands are innervated by a different pathway. This one involving cranial nerve nine. Cranial nerve nine innervates a salivary gland as well but it does it via a different ganglion, the otic ganglion. So let's change my drawing, arrows and color. So cells, oops, undo. Cells located in the brain stem of our central nervous system some of their axons form cranial nerve nine and cranial nerve nine. And again, I've gotten slightly out of line here. Oh, wait, hold on. Before I do that, let's cheat. 
So actually let's sneak it down here so that I have a little bit more space. You can come down here, you can come down here. And most importantly, I forgot, what's the name of cranial nerve nine again? Cranial nerve nine is, there we go. Glossopharyngeal, excellent. Our glossopharyngeal cranial nerve nine. It, as we saw, innervates the otic ganglion. And that otic ganglion also innervates salivary glands. So remember, we have three pairs of salivary glands, and we have two neural pathways for controlling them. Notice one other thing as well. Notice these are our four parasympathetic ganglia that have names. In fact, we only have four named parasympathetic ganglia. And all four of them have to do with the head. If we've learned anything, it's that our um, anatomists love to name everything. But if we go back to our picture, as we talked about, most of the ganglia are located inside of the organs, inside the connective tissues that surround the organ, right next to the organ. And so these things are hard to find. And if they're hard to find, there's no point in giving them a name. So instead, what they do for most of the ganglia and all the rest of the ganglia in the parasympathetic pathway, they just use a general term. And that general term is a terminal ganglion. So all of the remaining ganglion on our pathways, we're just gonna use the general term terminal ganglion. Now, our second to last pathway involves cranial nerve 10. And what was cranial nerve 10 again? Vagus. And remember, vagus is our wanderer. We said we would talk a lot about what it does. And in general, it goes to, as we said at the time, it goes to most of the organs in the ventral body cavity. But now we'll actually be more specific. Our vagus nerve is going to go to and control as well as receive information from the heart, the lungs, uh, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, the small intestine, and the proximal part of the large intestine. And I need a little more space underneath here, so I'm gonna, and I, in, in the interest of space, I'm gonna abbreviate small intestine, SI, and I am gonna abbreviate large, and actually large intestine I can leave like that. There we go. Remember, our vagus nerve we mentioned does about 90% of our parasympathetic output. Notice most of our structures, that pathway is through the vagus nerve. We of course start with ganglia located brainstem, nuclei, coming out of that, forming our uh, vagus nerve. That vagus nerve then, oh, I don't wanna use blue, hold on. Uh, undo, undo, purple, out. It goes to basically a bunch of different terminal ganglia and those terminal ganglia can go to any of these structures. So that's the good news. 
if I ask you as an essay question to describe the parasympathetic pathway to the heart or to the lungs or to the stomach or to the liver or to the gallbladder or to the spleen or to the small intestine or to the proximal part of the large intestine, the good news is the answer to every single one of those questions is the same. We start with a preganglionic neuron who's located in a nuclei of the brain stem. Its axons form vagus nerve 10, cranial nerve 10. That preganglionic neuron is myelinated and it goes all the way to a terminal ganglion at organ X, where it synapses in that terminal ganglion. And then the postganglionic axon forms a parasympathetic nerve that innervates the heart. And remember, the other nice thing is all of these postganglionic neurons all release acetylcholine. Yes, you can say three pairs of salivary glands on the exam. I'm not going to make you distinguish parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. Uh, you'll get to do that when you get to the digestive system in 431. All right. Five pathways. However, if you remember, anatomically, we said the parasympathetic nervous system uh, is the, uh, pardon me, we said anatomically, the parasympathetic nervous system is known as the cranial sacral branch of the autonomic nervous system. So far, we've just talked cranial. Oops. This needs to be moved down. There is still a sacral portion. And so that is the sixth possible pathway of the parasympathetic nervous system. In this case, it starts in the lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord. So unlike the rest of these, and let's draw a simp simple line just to separate that part of it. There we go. The sacral portion starts in the lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord. These axons are going to leave, and when they leave, they form obviously the ventral root of our spinal cord which then leads to our spinal nerve. But from there, it branches to form an elaborate parasympathetic structure that is known as the pelvic, and sometimes referred to as the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Now, on the exam, it is perfectly acceptable to say pelvic nerves, that these preganglionic axons form pelvic nerves. They're also known as pelvic splanchnic. And the reason I will tell you splanchnic here is because when we get to our sympathetic pathway, our sympathetic pathway has splanchnic nerves as well. The difference is our sympathetic has splanchnic nerves and our parasympathetic has pelvic splanchnic nerves. And that's actually how I remember them. P, parasympathetic, P, pelvic splanchnic. S, sympathetic, S, splanchnic. So that's why I use the term here, but you are welcome to use the term pelvic, that is fine as well. These pelvic nerves are going to, as we know, terminate on terminal ganglia. Because after all, as we talked about, um, only the ganglion of the head are named ganglia in the parasympathetic nervous system. So then the question that remains is what is it that these, the, this sacral portion of the spinal cord innervates? Well, if you think about it, it's everything that the vagus didn't. What that means is basically three things the distal part of the large intestine, 
That basically means the rectum and the anus. The urinary organs, all right, the ureters, the urethra, the bladder, and the reproductive organs. All right. So if you want to urinate, if you want to defecate, if you want to procreate, those three functions are controlled by the sacral branch of your parasympathetic nervous system. And again, I don't encourage you to do all three at once, but if you want to do any of those three things independently, then uh, you need that sacral portion of your uh, parasympathetic pathway to do that. So there you go. I can give you on the exam as an essay question, any visceral organ of the body, any smooth muscle, any cardiac muscle, any gland, and I could ask you for the parasympathetic pathway, and this is what you will tell me. You will tell me where the preganglionic neuron is located, what the preganglionic neuron's axon forms, where its synapses, and then where that parasympathetic nerve takes the information to the organ. And believe it or not, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, the parasympathetic are the easy pathways. Excellent question, absolutely. Not only should you uh, identify acetylcholine, but remember here's the key with our parasympathetic pathway. This preganglionic always, and let's change the colors of this to really emphasize this, because again, this is part one of the ways where it's will be easy. No matter what pathway it is, Remember, our preganglionic uh, neuron always releases acetylcholine and it is always excitatory. All right. So I guess I can sneak that in kind of here. Although, no, I want it up here because I really want to emphasize that may overlap a little bit. Maybe if I make it smaller, let's do that. There you go. Our preganglionic neuron always releases acetylcholine. It's always excitatory. Our postganglionic neurons also always release acetylcholine. But the effect is going to be determined by the effector. All right? Let's think about this. If my um, destination is the stomach, what effect does our parasympathetic nervous system have on the stomach? Is it excitatory or is it inhibitory to the stomach? Really, our rest and digest is going to be excitatory or inhibitory? It's going to be excitatory. Excellent. If instead the target was the heart, what would the effect be, excitatory or inhibitory? That would be inhibitory. So there you go, exactly. So yes, thank you for mentioning that. You're absolutely correct. You need to say what neurotransmitters they release. And the good part is that's pretty simple. Both are gonna release acetylcholine. The preganglionic is always excitatory. So really the only decision you have to make is what effect that, ac that acetylcholine is gonna have on these. Does it, can, does it stimulate it or does it inhibit? Does it excite it or inhibit it? And so hopefully that is great for it, right? Lacrimal glands, right? It is going to increase the activity of. Right, salivary glands, it's going to increase the activity of, and so on and so forth. All righty. So, like I said, believe it or not, this is the straightforward, this is the easy pathway. Now that we've drawn it all out, and again, I think like last time, looking at the picture really helps with this. So, now that we've actually written this out, and hopefully, you've written this out as well, let's go and back to the slide presentation and take a look at that again. And now we can see all those things we just finished talking about. All right, it starts here. Uh, where's my annotation? There we go. With four possible pathways starting in our central nervous system. 
All right, inside here are nuclei and their axons come out to form one of four cranial nerves, either cranial nerve three, ocular motor, cranial nerve seven, facial, cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve 10, vagus. And they innervate our only four named ganglia. Cranial nerve three goes solely to the ciliary ganglia, where its synapse is, and it innervates the smooth muscle of the eye. Cranial nerve nine only innervates the otic ganglion, which postganglionic neurons innervate one of our salivary glands. Seven's a teeny bit tricky. It branches to go to two different named ganglion. One of them is the pterygopalatine. And again, notice this just shows the lacrimal gland, but if we go to the next picture, notice here we more better see, more better see, that was really good English. Our pterygopalatine coming off of cranial nerve seven goes to both the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity as well as the lacrimal gland of the eye. But notice cranial nerve seven also branches to go to the submandibular, which goes to one of our salivary glands as well. And again, notice here, this illustration, it shows that the uh, facial goes to submandibular and sublingual, otic goes to parotid. You don't have to know the different salivary glands. So as far as we're concerned, both of these go the same place, salivary glands. All you have to do is say otic goes to salivary glands, submandibular goes to salivary glands, and you don't have to distinguish them. And those are the only named ganglia in the parasympathetic pathway. Notice the most elaborate pathway in our parasympathetic pathway is via the vagus nerve that wanderer that we talked about, almost 90% of our parasympathetic output. And like we talked about, heart, lungs, liver, gallbladder, stomach, pancreas, all of the small intestine, just the proximal part of the large intestine, the spleen, which isn't even in here, all of those structures, it goes to all of them. But notice, all of the ganglia are either inside or right next to the organs. So again, remember the ganglion doesn't have a name. We just call it a terminal ganglia. So all of the vagus pathways, all preganglionic neurons synapse on a terminal ganglia. And then it's that postganglionic neuron in the terminal ganglia that goes to the effector. But we can't forget about the sacral portion. Notice the sacral portion starts in the lateral gray horn of our spinal cord in the sacral region, out the ventral root to the spinal nerve, and then becomes those pelvic splanchnic nerves. And again, if you just wanna call them pelvic nerves, that is okay. But notice they go to the sigmoid column and the rectum and anus for defecation. The urinary system, the bladder, the ureters, the urethra for urination, and the reproductive organs for procreation. So it's our sacral branch of our spinal cord that controls these basic life functions. Right. And again, all terminal ganglia. Some of them are actually in the walls, so they use the term intramural because intramural means within the walls, but it's just harder to spell. Terminal ganglia is fine. And then again, here are those, that sacral portion of the cranial sacral pathway. And again, all discrete innervation. So we can control the stomach, right, without you urinating yourself at the same time. All right, you can salivate for food without being aroused by it. Not that some people aren't aroused by food, and if you are, that's perfectly okay to each their own, but it's not required. All right? And I know this, and you're not gonna believe it when I say it, but it really is just that simple. Because unfortunately, what we get to do next time is the sympathetic pathway. And the sympathetic pathway is much more elaborate. What I will tell you is your book does an excellent job of describing that pathway. All right? It can be a bit confusing, so I strongly, strongly encourage you to read it before Thursday's lecture. 
because Thursday's lecture is going to be rough. Especially because I don't have the opportunity to, to draw it on the board and visualize it. We're going to have to do it the same way we did this way, flipping back and forth between the pictures and the words. And so it's going to be even less intuitive than it normally is. So if you read it ahead of time, it will definitely be helpful. The good news is when we're done with it on Thursday, that's the rest of the new information you're responsible for. So you have five days to unpack that information and make sense of it before your exam on the following Tuesday. But the good news is Thursday's our last lecture. The bad news is we're talking about sympathetic pathways and it's gonna be rough. So preparing ahead of time will help you. All righty, questions on any of that? All right, I want to uh, encourage you to, as always, be safe, uh, be healthy, be happy. Uh, take the time to do that lab activities. We don't have a ton of lab activities that we get to do in this class. Take the time to do them. They're fun, right? Shine bright lights into each other's eyes. Uh, hit each other in the knees gently uh, with, uh, with uh, hammers and things along those lines. Not hammers, but something. Uh, if you don't have a reflex hammer, like I said, a, uh, a plastic, um, a plastic ladle has the right kind of curvature to it, the right kind of mass to it, where you can kind of usually elicit a response to that. If that doesn't work, uh, try a wooden spoon. A wooden spoon can be something. And again, start gentle and work your way out from there to get the effect that you want. Uh, play with those labs, do those, and then turn that in. That is a graded assignment uh, that I've decided to make you do to encourage you to get some lab stuff in here because we're running out of things that we can do for that. Uh, but we will be doing that. And uh, so that's due on Thursday as well. Uh, 1,500 points. No, I don't know. It's 10 points probably, just like a normal assignment. I haven't looked at it that closely. We'll see how much is involved. My guess is it's going to be five or 10 points. So do it. And again, anything you can't do, do not write, I could not do this. Do it as a thought experiment, right? Instead, this is what I think would happen. I was not able to do it. This is what I think will happen. And uh, like most assignments, it'll be five to 10 points. All righty. Any other questions? All right, then I will see you guys in two days. I will go ahead and uh, stop the recording at this point. If you have any last minute questions or anything, please feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I will see you in two days.